this first um, this first one really doesn't pertain to y'all. It was my um, hospital system wanted me to come in and teach twelve leads, um, and they were having an issue with EMS, and EMS was having an issue with the hospital system. So this was really designed for that kind of system where they weren't getting along. So I came in and and did it, and we got a STEMI program going for that place. And anyway. This was all about them trying to get two systems to work together, but there's some information out here that I think is relevant to everybody. First thing you need to know is I don't know everything. Um, you'll find there's there's a very few absolutes in medicine, and this is a dynamic career field that we're in. So things are going to change. Medicine evolves. Maybe the information I give you is six months old. I try to stay up on top of it. But if there's some information um, that you feel is relevant, bring it up. We'll talk about it. I'm cool with that. I want you to feel safe. Uh, everyone's going to pass. I don't know who Stacy was on this, but uh, I think it was Stacy Kerbin. But um, except for Shipley, he's going to fail, and that's okay. Failure is always an option. So we're human beings; we're not robots. Um, if you guys have any questions, don't be afraid to ask. If you got some additional information, that's fine. I'm cool with it. So we're all going to get together. This is for this hospital system. Um, the EMS or the ER was saying, well, the, the paramedics can't spell STEMI let alone <laughs> anyway and they would say the same thing this is where we were back in like 2004 time frame we just had lead two and there's a saying if you're in lead two you don't have a clue lead two really is just for rate and rhythm determination um eventually though we got more leads we ended up getting four lead monitors we call it four lead sometimes people will still call it a three lead because you can see three leads on the printout um but then we ended up with three leads and then sometime around 2005, the cardiac monitor showed up with uh, the precordial leads. And, um, and then we had a, a better view of what's going on. So we just looked in lead two. Literally, we did not see that the person was having this big semi. So that's why we want to take a uh, multi-lead approach to these. We had paramedics at the time um, because the 12 leads was fairly new back then that they didn't want to do 12 leads because it was more work for them. So it's not about us. It's about the patients. And it doesn't really change what we do. It just gives you more tools for the toolbox and to make your job any harder. Patients have better outcomes uh, when they go to a cath lab versus, you know, going to a, a referral center. It leads to better patient outcomes. They'll spend about three days, two or three days in a PCI center, and then they're discharged home versus with no PCI. That's that percutaneous intervention, balloon angioplasty stenting that um, they'll spend, you know, maybe 10 days. Uh, seven to 10 days, and then whatever damage is done is done. And it reminds me a long time ago, um, there were hospital systems that if you were having a uh, uh, an ischemic stroke, they would just put you on the floor and let you stroke out. They wouldn't do any interventions at all. It wasn't too long ago. And uh, so now, you know, there's interventions they can do 12 hours out from the time of insult. So um, yeah, back then, uh, they would just start, they would just have their STEMI and whatever damage was the damage they had in it. Could be the difference between this person, you know, going to their grandkids' graduation or going to a nursing home. So it's a big deal. Um, so medical people don't like change. Nobody likes change but a wet baby. And we are the exact same. So uh, we'll just get through some of this stuff. Statistically, we are in the stroke belt and the heart attack belt, the porn belt, the whatever belt you can think of. That's where we live. That's the ocean we're swimming in. Um, the Mission Lifeline came out, I want to say 2005, 2007, I'd have to look it up. And it was all about improving outcomes for STEMI patients. Now they've moved on to sepsis and stroke and some other things. That's why you see that big sepsis protocol push in the last few years. Uh, STEMI is what came out, you know, whatever now it's been 10 or 15 years ago. And what they were really trying to do was uh, they were trying to get all the pieces in place, the hospitals and the uh, EMS agencies, they were trying to get them all on board to do these STEMI protocols. And for the most part, I think it's, it's been well received and a lot of them do it. The STEMI chain of survival is early recognition by the patient, which can be kind of hard. And you'll, that's why you've seen advertisements over the years, like what is a heart attack? Um, now you see the billboards for strokes because they've moved on to strokes and sepsis and things like that. Um, early transport, either through uh, lytics or uh, clot busting drugs, or it's gonna be through balloon angioplasty and stenting. So there's some common phrases or terms you gotta know, EKGs, ECGs, those are all the same thing. 
PCI center, that's the place that has the cath lab where they're going to do interventions. We do have some facilities like Toomey that has a um, cath lab, but it's not for interventions. It's just an exploratory cath lab. So if your patient comes in with chest pain, shortness of breath, and maybe it's relieved with rest, nitro aspirin, they might send them up to their cath lab, squirt some dye and go, oh crap, they do have some occlusions. Then they have to you know, put a clamp on them and ground them over to a PCI center. Um, PCI centers where they do the interventions and the cardiologist is called an interventionist. So you talk to them, they're interesting. Uh, fibrinolytics, those are your clot busting drugs like Plavix. You have uh, the receiving centers, which are the, the PCI centers like Big Mac over here. I guess Carolinas does them too. Um, you know, you have Richland, Trident, there's all kind of non-PCI centers are like your Carolina Pines, Toomey's, those are referral centers. And of course, reperfusion is reestablishing blood flow to the heart. This is the difference between a non-STEMI and a STEMI. And also you could think of it as a stable angina versus unstable angina. The patient up here with a non-STEMI, they're walking to the mailbox and all of a sudden they get chest pain, shortness of breath, or doing some physical exertion. And then they sit down, catch their breath, and the symptoms are relieved. That's called stable angina. It's relieved with rest. Um, they're partially occluded, not fully occluded. The patients that are having a STEMI, that's 100% blockage. And what happens is they do some physical exertion. Maybe they walk up or down the stairs to go to the mailbox. They have chest pain, shortness of breath, diaphoresis, and then they rest and it does not relieve the symptoms. So that's unstable angina. So that's the difference in the occlusions there. Of course, plan A is gonna be, get them to a PCI center quickly, identify the STEMI. Hopefully the patient says, I think I'm having a heart attack and calls 911 or seeks medical attention somehow. And, um, and then hopefully the crew that shows up has 12 lead capability, acquires a 12 lead and says, yes, you need to go to a PCI center versus a referral hospital. The good thing in the market over here is it's easy to get to a PCI center, right? So if you think about services like um, Clarendon and Sumter, where um, you have the option between a PCI versus non-PCI center, that's where those 12 leads are extremely important. Because the 12 lead is a, it's not an exclusion criteria, it's an inclusion criteria. So um, you got to think all these hospitals um, that are PCI centers, they have scheduled CAFs going on all day long. And they make anywhere from $25 to $50,000 a CAF. And they're paying those interventionists around $450 to $500 an hour. So they're making a ton of money. Matter of fact, stints saved a lot of hospital systems in America, right? Stints don't fix the problem. They fix the symptoms of the problem. That makes sense. Having clogged arteries, they don't. They unclog that one artery, but it doesn't fix your overall health, right? You still be fat like me, and um, be at high risk for more. But they make a lot of money off those stents, and it's just you have to realize that when you're calling a STEMI in the field, you're bumping a paying customer out of line for someone who they don't know, right? I don't. If that's a 22 year old that's doing meth, cocaine, um, they're going to be not happy with you, right? Because it's almost like those trauma patients. You have those 20 something year olds riding motorcycles. They have very poor insurance or no insurance and they break a femur and you send them to a trauma center where they have scheduled orthopedics going on all day long. And that's with a person who had the initial consult and they've come back several times. They've established a good billing relationship with that patient. And then here you are bringing in some 20 year old that wrecked a crotch rocket, you know, out here on the highway and you can mess up their cash flow. So we want to make sure that we're bringing actual STEMIs the PCI centers. Does that make sense? They got, they're trying to make money. You just have to factor that in the back of your brain that this is a money game that we're in. Lytics are clot busters. And um, if you can't get to a PCI center, then you're going to referral hospital to get the Plavix on board. Uh, let's see, the ideal EMS system is that we're getting into. They have 12 leads in the field. Everyone's trained to do them. Um, and yeah, you have a good program. Program in place on what to do if whether it's a STEMI, not a STEMI, or a definite maybe, you know what to do. And then the ideal referral hospital, they're doing 12 leads in the lobby now, hopefully, first medical contact. They should be, they're supposed to be. Um, so when that person comes into the lobby, like I got the Cindy films for James Holiday, he let us use his uh, information with his permission. Um, he walked in with chest pain, shortness of breath, and the first person he met was a nurse with the 12 lead. And they did it in the lobby, or they have a little room where they get it, right? So they brought him into that room, acquired 12 lead, it's a STEMI. 
And also on the referral hospital, they'll have a system in place to rapidly get them to a PCI center, whether by air or by ground. The ideal patient um, understands that these are symptoms of a heart attack. That's why you've seen so many public uh, information things on it. And they'll seek help. This is just kind of a flow chart of the whole thing. Uh, which I think it's funny that the patient realizes they have on <laughs> within five minutes, they're calling an ambulance. Probably not, but whatever. That's ideal, right? So let's get, let's get through some of this stuff. This is what a stent looks like when it's deployed. This is a bare metal stent. It has a balloon underneath it and this right on this catheter. And they have stents that are actually coated with Plavix. And when they deploy the stent, it, releases plavix in the area of the clot. And an interesting conversation I have with the interventionist is how you how do you decide who gets a bare metal stent versus one that has medication on it? And they look at someone's dental. They well this is this interventionist, like maybe not all of them, but they look at their teeth. So most of the time they'll show up naked or nearly naked on the cath lab table. They have very little to go by. So they'll look in their mouth if they have taking care of their teeth, they probably have a dental plan. If they have a dental plan, that means they have health insurance. So they'll give them um, the Plavix because Plavix is very expensive. And if you don't have insurance, you probably will not re refill that $600 Plavix um, order. And then they're, they're at high risk for restenosis. So they'll make a quick decision based off someone's teeth. So take care of your teeth. Brush those teeth. Okay, there's that. Any questions on what stints look like? I'll take that as a no. Let's see. Get this thing pulled up. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yes. Well, could be. They probably have some type of symptoms. So, because you think about this, the symptoms range from malaise, weakness, I just don't feel good, to like, you know, near cardiac arrest or cardiac arrest. So, this is a wide spectrum of symptoms. And um, they might see a doctor, they might report to the ER if they just haven't been feeling good for a week. Um, maybe they have some mild shortness of breath. They get referred to a cardiologist. The cardiologist does some, um, either squirts and die, or uh, they figure out they have some blocked blockages in their arteries and fatty deposit, fatty streaks. So they'll go ahead and stent them. So if there's a certain percentage of that vessel that's occluded, they just stent them open. Probably that mixed with some fatty streaks or something. Coronary artery disease prevents them from constricting down and dilating out. It reduces the flexibility of those arteries. So that's probably what it was. Maybe they didn't have a STEMI, but they had some blockages. Everyone else, they're probably putting them on statins and uh, controlling their diet, trying to reduce their uh, cholesterol levels, keep those fatty streaks down. Is that good? Okay, 12 lead, 12, 15 leads. I include 15 leads, so we'll talk about that too. Quick introduction to 12 leads. Um, you'll learn what the J point is, identify ST segment elevation, what your lead views are. We'll put it all together and we're gonna start reading these. This, this is not hard. I know you're thinking like, this is hard and you probably are because a lot of paramedics are like, oh my God, this 12 leads, dude, you know? But this is not hard. It's very simple, very simple method, I'll show you. There's only two things that you need to know, what you're looking for and where you're looking. So what you're looking for is the lead, or what you're looking for is that J-point elevation. Where you're looking is the lead, the lead view. What is a STEMI? ST elevated myocardial infarction, exactly. So this is only detectable with the 12 lead cardiac monitor. These are candidates for immediate reperfusion, and that's either gonna be through lytics, or balloon angioplasty stenting. So hopefully everyone here has access to a PCI center by ground or by air. It might be difficult in some of the markets like Sumter, if you have bad weather. I don't know where um, 
the chief Hinks is on you guys leaving the county for STEMIs. Excellent. I think, think I think that's great. Yeah. So we had the same problem at Shaw. We'll have a, if you think about where we're positioned at Shaw, we are west of Toomey by about 12 miles. Once it's about 37 mile trip to the PCI center by ground. So minus 12, um, 37 miles, what was that, 25 miles? Close enough, math. It's not my strong suit, right, I'm paramedic. So it's difficult to get, a, um, to get someone to go, well, I'm gonna spend 30 minutes with my STEMI patient versus 15 minutes with the STEMI patient. But if you go 15 minutes in this direction, they literally are have to travel back 15 minutes in that direction, right? So they're better off just turning and going to a PCI center in Columbia versus taking them to Timmy. And that's a fight that I'm having out there. Well, you wouldn't think so. It's To me, it's easy. It's an easy thing. I will tell you, the um, with the company I was associated with, we did a lot of STEMI transports. And our data over those 10 years was that 20% of our STEMI patients did code during the transport. So they are at high risk for cardiac dysrhythmia during transport. So we uh, started a policy. We got every, all of them back but one. Uh, so, and almost everyone was on the first shock back. So you just zap them and they wake back up. So, and that really just goes to show you that early defibrillation really is the key, right? But to get early defibrillation, once we identified the patient was having a STEMI, then we switched out those 12 lead, um, the precordial leads for pads. So we would just put the defib pads in place and then safely trans them at, transport them at a high rate of speed towards the BCI center. And if the patient did get into VFib, VTAC, it was just a shock and they were back. So that's my advice to you. If you have someone that you've identified isn't a STEMI, like this happens, you know, I work a little bit over at Clarendon. If I get someone that's having a STEMI and I'm waiting for the helicopter 20 or 30 minutes, once I've identified a systemic, the, the post uh, 12 leads, you know, the serial 12 leads after that, honestly, they don't matter. So if I give them nitro aspirin and they reperfuse and it returns back to baseline, it really doesn't matter. They're already going to the cath lab. You know what I'm saying? And I just do three, my three and four leads after that. And I put those darn pads on their chest because two out of 10, probably going to code on you, probably going to have a dysrhythmia. While well, it's possible to determine an acute MI by clinical presentation, it's impossible without a 12 lead or 15 lead ECG to call it a STEMI. So having said that, we treat everyone with chest pain, shortness of breath, diaphoresis as you're having an acute coronary syndrome, you're having a heart attack, right? So regardless of what the 12 lead says, because these are only about 50% sensitive to a STEMI to start with. Why is that? You're only looking at the middle of the heart to the back of the heart. So you remember all the regions of the heart? I know Shannon said y'all learned I see all leads. So you have inferior, septal, anterior, lateral. We have posterior, right? So you have those five parts. Well, you're only seeing like three of the five parts on the 12 lead. So that's why I teach the 15 lead. This is your normal 12 lead layout. You have three columns, I'm sorry, three rows and four columns. There's your columns. These are all two and a half second snapshots. So this all together is a 10 second strip that we have. So when you ask that, you're gonna ask your patient, just try to control your breathing, not move around much. We're gonna get your 12 lead. What, you have to do it for about 10 seconds. So after that, it's okay. So for that reason, you're only seeing it a two and a half second snapshot. We don't use the 12 lead for rate and rhythm determination. You'll, while you're getting your 12 lead prepared, maybe you'll run a 10 second strip and lead two. Um, and then you'll see two, one and three because we're looking for axis deviation. And then when you get this, this is to determine whether or not they're having a STEMI. Rate and rhythms off a of lead to your rate and rhythm strip. So if you send me this and ask me what the what is this rhythm, I usually say, well, you don't determine really. I get into that weird little spiel, like, hey, it's hard to tell from this. I mean, I could kind of suss this out a little bit. It's a sinus rhythm, and I could figure out the rate 300, 150, 100, 75, 60. So the rate's around 60. It's a sinus rhythm. You know what I mean? But unless you see the whole 10 seconds, you don't get a very good snapshot of what the rate and rhythm is. So these are lead one, two, three. AVR stands for augmented voltage right, augmented voltage left, augmented voltage inferior. Everything over here on this side of this strip is all augmented voltage. It's all amplified back to the screen. So for that reason, there is no exact anatomical position 
that these leads have to go in. If you're going to do a 12 lead, you need to have the, the chest leads out on the limbs. So they need to be out on the deltoids or down lower than where the leg meets the trunk. And I've had people say, well, Zoll says, the manufacturer says, on the Zoll, you can put them on the torso. Well, if you're following the manufacturer's recommendation, good for you. I looked at the physio control and it says not on the chest. So if you're using a life pack 15 to get a diagnostic 12 lead, they need to be out on, at least on the deltoids and lower than where the leg meets the trunk. Does anyone ever want to go to call off the jam? You know what I'm talking about? That's roller derby. You ever gone to a roller derby thing? They do that, call off the jam. You should watch roller derby, it's fun. So this is all augmented voltage. Literally, if I took these leads and put them all over my face and my neck, I will see a rate and rhythm. It not, might not be a beautiful sinus rhythm, but you'll see electrical activity. If you do that with these precordial leads, the chest leads, if I wrap them around my leg, you're not going to see much of anything. They have to be, these have to be in the anatomical position. The limb leads do not. So these are all limb leads, augmented voltage. That side's what you see is what you get. And for that reason, that's why these are kind of just put in general areas. And these are, there's three of them that are put in specific spots. So this kind of confusing slide, this is all those Free, uh, limb leads that are on this side are looking at the heart in this vertical plane. So there, if you took that basketball or whatever, you would slice it in this fashion. That's your limb leads. And if you drew a big circle around this compass, this would be zero and 180. And as you go down, this is 90 degrees. That's minus 90 degrees. And it's split in 30 degree sections. So 30, 60, 90, 120, 150, 180. And so lead two is at 60. If you start learning those degrees, I think for me, it helps me understand where the lead views are. And because lead two is in the most direct view of that ventricle, it has the best view for rate and rhythm. And that's why, generally speaking, everyone uses lead two to look at the rate and rhythm. And then we'll use lead one and lead three to determine coronary axis. Because these have two wide views of the heart, and we can see if it deviates to the left, the left side of the heart, or deviates to the right. The other lead you have on here, so uh, let me get back to this a little bit. So leads one, two, and three, they actually have the things on their body, right? These four electrodes. And those are what is being printed. Lead two goes across the heart, one goes across this way, and three's up and down. And then the computer guesstimates where AVR, AVL, and AVF is. So those augmented voltage leads are like the computer saying, okay, well, if there was a lead there, it would look like this. So those are computer generated leads. V1 through V6 is like if you had a hula hoop with GoPro cameras on it, and it just goes in this transverse or horizontal plane. So they're looking at the middle of the heart, the front of the heart, and the side of the heart. You cannot see the right side of the heart, and you cannot see the back side of the heart with a 12 lead. But I'm going to show you how to do a 15 lead, which takes care of that. So this is one, two, three, AVR, AVL, AVF. And then V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. Everybody's good with all that? Okay. So what we're looking for is called a J point. It's the junction between that QRS complex and the T wave. So that is the ST segment. So it's the segment between that S wave and the T wave. Specifically, it is located where the QRS terminates and it makes a sudden change in direction. So at the end of the QRS, where it makes a sudden change in direction. So here is our QRS complex, QRS, that makes a sudden change in direction right there. Super easy. So QRS, sudden change in direction right there. That's the J point. I just put a bunch of J points up here because you're going to hear a weird term called a J wave. That's a wave on the J point. So let's just start up here. This is a Q, R, S wave, and where it makes a sudden change in direction, that's the J point. Here's our Q, R, S wave, sudden change in direction, that's a J point. Q, R, S, here's our sudden change, that's a J point. Q, R, S, sudden change in direction, there's your J point. And in this strange example, you have a QRS complex, but look, there's a waveform on the J point. It's called a J wave. And I have a 
we'll have a module today, a quick 17 slides on benign early repolarization. It's called BER, and that's where you're going to see that J wave again. 20 years ago, there used to be this uh, a sign in the hospital, and um, it would have a smiley face. So you would see like a smiley face here, and if it was smiling, it was not a heart attack. And if it was frowning, it was a heart attack, but they were re referencing a J wave because those J waves are possible imposters. So in this example, here's our Q wave, R, S, and it makes a sudden change in direction right there. Everybody's on board with that? Nobody's confused, right? Okay. All right, so here's our Q, R, S wave, and then look, it makes a sudden change right there. Everybody's good with that? Yeah, absolutely. Because it changes direction. It was going in this direction, then it suddenly changed to go in that direction. Yep, it just changed direction. So in this example, here's our QRS, because it's after the S wave where it makes a sudden change in direction. So it went from going this way to going that way. See if you guys can get this one, A, B, or C. B. Everyone got B, bravo. You good? Simple, this is simple stuff, right? If you, it's not simple. Just simple. You got it. Everybody's good. All right. A, B, or C. B. B. Yeah. It's A, B, C. Yeah, it's B. How about A, B, or C? B. B. We're halfway there. If you could find that, then you just have to know what your lead views are. So you. Find the J point, it has to have at least one millimeter of elevation. Now, this is the AHA standard. There are some local protocols that I've read that require you to have two millimeters. But this is the AHA standard. If your reference material says something else, then that's your reference material. I, I, I've learned over the years, I don't argue with people. I say, thank you for your feedback. Boop, boop, thank you. Have a blessed day. Um, so, AHA says if it's a millimeter or more, it's significant. So, when you're finding your J point, make sure you you compare it to the TP segment, which is the isoelectric line, not to the front up here, this PRI, because there are certain medical conditions and drugs that cause depression of the PRI. Like, have you ever heard of a dig dip? Yep, that causes a depression of that PRI complex. So you wouldn't want to compare it over here because then it looks elevated. You want to compare it back to the TP segment, which is just fancy for the isoelectric line. Yep, the general kind of isoelectric line that's running through everything. Yeah, and it's you can see it pretty good over at the TP segment. There should be some gap right there. So when I find my my elevation or my J point, like QRS complex, sudden change of direction, when I was learning this, I would just pull out like my, my driver's license or ticket or whatever, and I would just put it on the TP line, and it's either elevated or not elevated. Right now, we're just worried about elevation. We'll talk about depression later, but we're looking for elevation. In this case, it's not elevated, so I just go to the next one. I just, I move on. I just grow on down the strip. So here we have our QRS complex. It makes a sudden change in direction right here. I take my whatever reference material here, I put on the TP line. Is it elevated? Is it one block? So it's significant. So I note I have ST segment elevation. We're going to build onto that because it has to be in two or more anatomically contiguous leads, but that's okay. We're these are building blocks. So this is our RS complex from that whoever I was talking to earlier. This is the RS, and it makes a sudden change. I'm marking mine right there at the tip of that folder. That's what I'm putting as my J point. So yeah, greater than one at least. I'm not sure what it says at the bottom. A millimeter. It's, it's more than a millimeter, but everyone sees. How we got there? All right, here's our RS complex. It makes a sudden change right there. That's where I'm marking mine is right there. And then I'll take my thing. Is it elevated? No, I don't know how straight I have that, but no, not elevated. So 
when we're calling a STEMI, it's technically right now it's not significant. Um, this is my where I mark my sudden change in direction. Yep, it's a one millimeter of elevation. Here's our QRS complex. I'm marking my J point right there at that tip. And here's my TP line. So that one is actually depressed. That's what we, the term they use for a lowered ST segment is depression. So that one's depressed, right? But it's not elevated. And we're right now we're worried about elevation. All right, so here's my QRS complex. I'm marking the tip of that right there as my J point. And I compare it back to my little tiny TP line there. It's elevated, at least it's over a millimeter, but a millimeter plus. So this one, myself and Dr. Clanton disagreed on, and that's fine. I'm okay with disagreeing on anyone for any reason. It doesn't bother me that someone doesn't uh, believe what I believe. I base my stuff off of, you know, mostly all self-taught. Go back one. So where the tip of this folder is, that's what I'm marking as my J point. And then my TP segment is this little tiny piece right here. So it's about a millimeter and a half, but it's greater than a millimeter. And this is the one that me and Dr. Clanton disagreed on. That's okay. I marked my J point here at the top of this where that's in my opinion, where it makes a sudden change in direction. He marked his down here as his J point. But here's the thing, like when we were talking this out, I said, okay, I'm, I'm cool with that. He's, well, you see what I mean? I said, I see what you mean, but I don't agree with you. But does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. So it's purely an academical conversation we're having, right? The, the patient still has ST segment elevation. But I think that's the most correct J point, and he thought that was. I'm okay with that. Definitely elevated. And, you know, a, a great example, this happened with uh, Shannon back when she was in paramedic school, if you don't mind me telling a story about you. I'm in the hallway, just dropped my patient off. She hands me a strip and she says, hey, what do you think this is? I said, oh, it's a first degree AV block. She goes, okay, cool. I said, what do you think it is? She said, first degree AV block. I said, excellent, you're doing great, man. She disappears around the corner. Here comes a paramedic, red, frothing at the mouth. <laughs> Pissed. I said, hey, man, what's going on with you? He goes, I got a damn paramedic student ride with me. And I told her what the strip was. She said it's something else. And I said, what'd you, what'd you, what, what, I don't know. I didn't know you, she was actually riding at the time. Um, I didn't know she was the one we were talking about. I said, well, what'd they say it was? He goes, they're walking around telling everybody it's a first degree AV block. I said, well, what'd you call it? He goes, third degree block. I said, is that the strip Shannon has? He goes, yes. I said, looks like a first degree AV block to me. So he gets madder. I said, hey, man, you got to calm down. I went to shake his hand. He slapped it like he was spiking a volleyball. Slap, slapped my hand away from him. I said, dude, you need to chill out. You're teaching people how to respond to disagreements, right? You're showing, you're teaching Shannon that it's okay to act like a crazy person in the ER because you disagree with the EMP, the, the paramedic student. I was like, you need to calm down, dude. So what is your... Well, I'll show you. It can be confusing. I, I'll show you. I, I can see what the doctor's point of view is. I can kind of, where, where was your justification? To me, this is the end of the QRS, and it made, in my opinion, a sudden change right here. Okay. And he said, no, it makes a sudden change right there. And I said, yeah, I kind of see, see what you're saying. I see where yours is. Now. Yeah. I was saying, to me, this is a sudden change in direction. And he said, no, to him, that is. And you know what? It's okay. Because it's still elevated. Now, if that, if the, the way I look at it too is if you move this TP line up to here, I would still say to me that looks like it's, yeah, because I think that's the J point. And so, but I think it's okay to disagree. That's okay. Um, we're all humans, right? I'm not perfect at this stuff. And, and uh, there's studies that show that paramedics in general do a better job calling 12 leads than ER doctors. Because the ear doctors have to know everything about everything, right? We just need, we just have kind of a specialty that we're in emergency medicine. So we can kind of focus on these things. And you know what they have we don't have? 
they have referrals to specialists. They could just have someone else look at it. You know what I mean? They can Google it. And the big thing the, the, the hospital has on their time is so, time. Time is on their side. You know, um, let's say someone has met spectrum of symptoms, malaise, weakness, just I don't feel good. They can park them in a room for six or eight hours and see what happens. And if they live, they go, eh, you're fine. We don't know, right? We meet them in the first, we got 20 minutes to sort it out. And uh, so at the end of the encounter, we're like, I don't know if they're sick or not. Well, they don't know either, but the eight, eight or 12 hours later, they go, yeah, there's nothing wrong with them. It's bull crap. Okay, so we're halfway there. We know what we're looking for, which is SC segment elevation. Now we just have to figure out which lead that's viewing the elevation. There's a lot of things you're going to hear uh, descriptors about leads. You'll hear uh, bifocal limb leads, unifocal limb leads. I just want you to remember, uh, it's backwards and weird. I just want you to remember that each lead has one and only one positive electrode and uh, it functions like a camera. So that positive electrode, let's say the positive electrode is down here in the leg. Um, there's, this is two, three and eight VF and it looks in three different directions that one lead does, but it only looks at the negative electrode. So if it's looking at, if it's utilizing that as lead two, it's looking at the negative electrode here on my shoulder. So it's look, the camera's looking across this way, right? So that's two, three in AVF, so three looks up the side of the heart this way. So when that lead is now switching to look at lead three, it just changes the negative electrode from this shoulder to this shoulder, and it looks straight up from here, from this point of view up to my left shoulder. And then the two, the AVF part, the computer uses fancy microprocessing to estimate where if lead AVF was somewhere down here near the, the nope rope, right? So, cause it's at a 90 degree straight down, well, to be positive, but it just guesstimates where that would be. Everybody's cool with that? So the positive electrode just looks at the negative electrode. The, the, what we're looking at too is the left ventricle. So when you're looking at a 12 lead, you're looking at the left ventricle. You're looking at the middle, yep, the septum, and then the anterior, lateral, and the inferior part of the left ventricle. You cannot see the right side of the heart on a 12 lead, and you cannot see the back of the heart. But that's why we would do a 15 lead. You can do a 13 lead where you move one lead over, hit acquire again, or why, why not just pop two more leads off and put them on their back, and then you can run a 15 lead. And I, I think I recently saw one of the social media cardiology paramedics post, well, I don't do 15 leads because I don't need a 15 lead to see anterior, posterior elevation because I'll see anterior depression. That only happens 8% of the time. So you do need to do, you need to move the leads around. To the best of my knowledge, you should. Um, yeah, the QRS is the left ventricle. The left ventricle Let's say the left ventricle is mo more muscular and bigger than the right ventricle. So imagine we had Mr. Shipley up here as the left ventricle. So we'll say you're lead two. I'm Mr. Shipley. I'm a big dude. And then we have um, Veronica, Victoria, sorry. Um, I have Victoria standing behind Mr. Shipley and you're lead two, you're the leads. Well, they're both working and firing off at the same time, but you cannot see Victoria behind the left ventricle because it's so muscular and it's out front. Does that make sense? Sorry about that, Veronica. I think that's a song I really like by uh, Elvis Cassetto, but I'm not sure. Um, by Elvis Presley. So the lead views. This lead here is 2, 3, and AVF. I like to think of uh, F as inferior, right? They all share the same lead, but they only have one positive electrode. This is looking up at their, their androgynous crotch. So this is the left leg. It is kind of weird looking, isn't it? This is the crotch. This is a nipple. That's a nipple. So there's the nipples. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of weird. So this is the same as like being down here. And yeah, it's looking up at the bottom of the heart. So two, three, and AVF, because it's looking from the bottom up, are called inferior leads. So, you know, think about the inferior vena cava. It's coming from the bottom up. This is the inferior lead. And it's literally just looking up at the 
the bottom of the heart, the inferior portion of the heart. Most of your STEMIs are inferior MIs. The, the, re, the reasoning I believe for that is your MIs that include the anterior, septal anterior lateral portion of the heart, they're at high risk for VFib and VTAC. And those patients are usually in cardiac arrest when you get there, right? So they might call 911, someone's got chest pain, shortness of breath. If you have an inferior MI, you gen generally have Brady dysrhythmias. They Brady down, Brady down, Brady down, and then eventually they'll go into VFib. If you have an anterior septal lateral MI, they have tachy dysrhythmias. So they'll quickly go into VFib, VTAC, and die. So most of those people are in cardiac arrest when you get there, where the inferior MI people, they're kind of circling the drain on you. Does that make sense? We had a dude walking behind Shaw Air Force Base on Patriot Parkway years ago. And so he's walking along. Someone calls 911 because they see a body laying on the road and thought he got hit by a car. Um, no, he had a massive widow maker heart attack, right? He had a proximal left coronary artery occlusion. They found this out on, of course, autopsy. But when, they, when the crews got on scene, the only trauma he had was he had a laceration on his chin. His entire chin was split open, but he did not bleed. So what happened was he's walking along Probably got dizzy, and before he hit his face on the concrete, he was dead, and his heart was not pumping because his, his chin was split wide open, but it did not bleed. He was not hit by a car or anything else. So odds are the blood flow stopped to the brain, and he went down, and he stayed down. Okay, inferiority, looking at the bottom of the heart. Everybody's good with that? V1 and V2, that's the center of your heart, the center of your nose, the center of your brain, the center of everything is called A. Yeah, what do you call it when you get a piercing out there? Septum. So this is septal. That's okay. So when you put your I this is the way I learned it. I put my hands on my body. And I was just remember middle of my chest, V1 and V2. Middle leads, V1 and V2. Three and four are in front of my heart because my heart's actually pointed in this direction, off to the left. So that's anterior under my boob over here. And then on the side, like, I don't know anything about football, but I do know they call it a lateral when they throw the ball off to the side. So these are lateral views. So V1 and V2, and they look directly in through the chest at the septal portion of the heart. You get a little bit of view of some of this right coronary artery perfusion, but mostly it's left anterior descending, the left coronary artery. So it's your left coronary artery, left circumflex, and then your right coronary artery. V3 and V4 are on the front of the heart, right here out front. And they're gonna look right directly in on the apex, that cone of the left ventricle. And look at this beautiful view of the left coronary artery and some of that left circumflex. V5 and V6 are lateral views. So they're looking directly in at the left side of the heart there. And then one and AVL are out here on the left arm. And they're looking high lateral. So here's our normal lateral view down here. This is five and six. You can't see it's hidden by the arm. They're looking straight in. This is a high lateral view. If you were to put the, leg, the, tor the leads that go on the legs, if you put them on the torso, they would have a low lateral view. So that's why you want those leads lower than where the leg meets the trunk. And then always put them at the same altitude. So if you have a patient that's got like a amputated leg and you put one lead way down here, don't put the other one up here. So put them at the same height. So once again, the middle is septal, the front, the side, and the bottom. Excellent. And you cannot see the right side of the heart on a 12 lead. And this has led to a lot of that. I don't know if you've heard of OMI versus STEMI. Has anyone heard of that language? No, there's a group uh, out there that hate 12 leads and they don't like the term STEMI. They prefer OMI. And it just means occluded myocardial infarction. It means the same thing. But since you only see about half the heart on a 12 lead, that means that you don't see all of the heart and you will not see all of the heart attacks, right? All, this, all the occluded myocardial infarctions. So if you do a 15 lead, then you can. So what you do is you take V4 off, and we'll show you where the leads go. You put on the right side. That's now called V4R. 
there was a study back in the 70s, um, and I think the lead doctor was uh, Zelensky, which oddly enough today is not the guy from from uh, from Kazakhstan. No, it's not Kazakhstan. Who's at war right now? Russia and Ukraine. He's not the the president of Ukraine. So this guy uh, Zelensky is the one who said, okay, he figured out if you just move that one lead over there and hit acquire, you only need one. Um, one lead with elevation to prove right ventricular infarction. All the other ones, we need two anatomically contiguous leads. But with the Zelensky lead, you only need that one lead to be elevated. Patients with right ventricular infarctions can be preload dependent. They have Brady dysrhythmias. That preload dependent means that they, are, they need the blood that's coming in from the superior and inferior vena cava to stretch this right ventricle out so it pumps effectively. We'll talk a little about preload dependency in a minute, I'm sure. Oh, God, it's right here on this slide. So this is from the 2011 stuff, and I cannot find where everyone keeps referencing the 2020 change, um, but I think they did change some of the language a little bit. This is what it used to say. It said, with inferior eyes and right ventricular infarction, the use of nitro, use nitro with caution with patients having an inferior MI, um, if what's well, a known inferior wall in MI. And if the patient has a right-sided um, uh, or has a right ventricular infarction, you don't give them any volume depleting drugs, which is like Lasix, and you don't give them any nitro. So it contraindicated the use of nitro with a right-sided infarct. And they said for everyone else, which is what they talked about for years, if you have an inferior MI, use caution. Well, how do you use caution with nitro? You spray it in your hand, dab it on their tongue, you paste them, right? Um, the difference in the spray nitro and paste. Does anyone have any experience with inter in, in facility transfers or in hospital stuff? Like, has anyone ever worked in the ER? Well, do you know what the hospital starts nitro off at? What their drip rate is? 10 mics, 10 mics a minute, right? So there's a saying for critical care three is 10. Three mLs an hour equals 10 mics a minute. So if you do any of those transfers with nitro hanging, but sometimes they'll tell you if you get into the transfer stuff uh, or critical care, they'll say the patient's on 20 mics of nitro. And then you look at the monitor, the IV pump, and it says 20 mLs an hour. Well, if three equals 10, then six mLs equals 20, right? So they're not on 20 mics. Uh, and they're like, I don't know why their blood pressure's in the tank. We're giving them levofed. You know what I mean? Well, it's because you're running them at like 80 mics. Okay. So just know that the hospital starts them off at 10. Well, when you spray a patient with nitro at 0 0.4 milligrams, which is equivalent to 400 mics, and it's absorbed over two minutes. So they're getting a 200 mic per minute infusion of nitro. So 200 mics is what we give them. The hospital gives them 10 mics. So you see there's a big disparage, uh, a difference in dosing, right? Because we're given nitro for CHF, which is different than heart attacks. But we have, we just, that's the dose we have. So what it used to mean was before you give nitro, you start two large bore IVs and you are prepared for the blood pressure to tank on you. So I'm telling you, they, the science is not completely in on this. It's kind of whatever. It's, uh, it still needs to be studied. But I have seen patients with inferior mice, right ventricular infarctions. I've seen them spray with nitro have their eyes roll back in their head, and then they go into cardiac arrest because their blood pressure is so low, you can't feel a pulse. It's called pulseless electrical activity, and it's an indication to do this, right? So I've literally seen this happen multiple times where the patient's eyes roll, uh, may have a little seizure, and then they're in cardiac arrest. It takes two minutes to metabolize the nitro. So one cycle into the CPR, they wake, they wake up. Their eyes start to blink, and then they set up in the bed, and they're like, we saved them! Really? Did you really save them or did you put them in cardiac arrest? So what I would tell you to do, there's a, there's a class, not ACLS, but it's ACLS for the experienced provider. And it teaches in that class, if you have an inferior MI with right ventricular infarction, the treatment is two 16 gauge IVs, two large bores, and two liters of fluid wide ass open. And the reason you would do that is it's the right side of the heart that's infarcted and they're preload dependent. There's a rule called uh, uh, Starling's Law. There's a law called Starling's Law that says the more you stretch it, the better it pumps. 
So those patients are preload dependent. They want to put as much fluid as they can in that right ventricle. It'll stretch and it'll pump better. The problem with the whole thing is, the whole shebang, is if you have a patient's got a left-sided heart failure and you give them fluids, you drown them. Okay? So the left ventricle pumps the, blood, the fluid out of the lungs, right? Correct? Into the body. The right ventricle pumps the fluid into the lungs. So if that left ventricle is failing, you're going to have pulmonary edema. So those patients, they need all the nitro in the world. So if you ever, you've probably seen this, you go to someone who's got pink frothy sputum or their blood pressure's through the roof and they're gurgling when they breathe. Have you ever seen a paramedic just like soak them down? Like they can give them, like I've seen them do a squirt and it wasn't a good squirt. So they'll squirt it maybe two or three times. And literally the nitro is just dripping off their face like Gene Simmons. And uh, you can smell it in the air, the starter fluid in the air. You know what I mean? They do fine. You can give them all the nitro. They do just fine. Because what you're trying to do with nitro is you're trying to reduce preload of the heart. So you're dropping, you're dilating them out, which therefore lowers the amount of blood returning to the heart. You drop preload with nitro. So when you drop preload, instead of a bunch of fluid going to the heart, less does, and they can pump more out of the lungs. So it reduces pulmonary edema. So here's the, the whole thing is you have to know whether the person's having a right-sided infarction or a left-sided infarction. Right-sided, no nitro, plenty of fluids. Left-sided, all the nitro and no fluids. Yes. You can. I like that. Yeah. So the so think about this. Let's say uh, I'm the right ventricle and I'm damaged, right? I've I'm having a right side of I'm not having a I'm not doing very good. So I'm down here working. I'm pumping. That's it. <laughs> Doing so good, and then the brain's gonna go, What's going on down there? And I say, Hey man, can you? Uh, I need some more help. Can you send me some more blood? Starlings, all I'll pump better. So the brain says, Yeah, I can do that. So, what does the body do? How does the body get more blood into that right chamber? It vasoconstricts, you know what I'm saying, it, which increases the blood pressure because it's trying to squirt more blood into the right ventricle. And then if we come along with nitro, we're just wiping out homeostasis, right? We're just trying to undo what the brain's trying to do. They also have a tendency to Brady down. So it slows down. Like, I need more help, but I, I can't work so hard. So it slows down. Yeah. Yeah, pacing. Like uh, someone mentioned over here, it's to me, it's safer to paste because if they do start having problems, you can literally take it off and wipe the skin really good. Where once you squirt it, it's in there for two minutes. Yeah. You will not see it on a traditional 12 lead. So you, you have to do V4R. So the, so the indications for me to do a 15 lead is I get a clean 12 lead. So my, the person, I had some indication to 12 lead, right? And it, the spectrum could be malaise to near death. So I said, the, anything above the elbows and knees nowadays, you should do 12 lead on it. And we do a 12 lead and it's clear. I go, hmm, that's crazy. I was expecting to see a STEMI. So that would be an indicator for me to slide a lead over here and throw two on the back, hit acquire again, it's a 15 lead. And then, um, or if I get an inferior MI. So most 60% of your STEMIs are going to be inferior MIs. So just Slap a lead over here because you need to know if the right, right ventricle is infarcted. I don't do the entire right-sided EKG like the book will tell you to do. Um, I just move the one lead over because the Zelensky study from the 70s said you, have, you can do that. So before I give them any nitro at all, I slide a lead over here, hit acquire again. That's a 13 lead. And if I, if I think the patient's like super symptomatic fixing to die, I might only do a 13 lead. But if I got time, I'll throw the leads on the back. Hit acquire. And that just tells me a green light. Like if it's just an inferior MI, I'm going to use caution. I'm going to paste them. If it's a right-sided, I'm not giving me nitro. I, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to start two large bore IVs and I'm going to start giving them fluids. Say again, I'm sorry. V4, okay, yeah. You, we're going to take V4 
and stick it on the right side. So that's called V4R and the R is for right. And then I pop five and six off and I'll show you where to put them on the back for V8, V9. Yep, same spot, exact same spot, but on the right side, midclavicular. 10 more minutes and we'll break for lunch. Everybody's cool with that? All right, so this is the normal chart that comes with everything. And I'm, I'm not about uh, rote um, memorization, but this is something you can learn by looking at this. The last thing I want people to do is to go up to someone and go, oh my God, you could be having a life-threatening STEMI. We have to do a 12 lead. So, you know, get out those titties, right? We're gonna, um, so our breast, this is a medical class, get those breasts out. Yes, get out those flapjacks. And what happens is, because the patient's gonna see that you're very concerned, right? And then now their anxiety is going through the roof. What, then you pull, you do the 12 lead and you go, hold on, bloop, and then you have to pull out a chart. You're know, like trying to do one of these, like, eh. so you can learn this. It's not hard. It's easy. And I'm going to show you how. Um, these are very easy. The numbers just have to line up. So anatomically cont contiguous means the numbers line up on this side. Um, and you just have to remember septal, anterior, lateral. I like when I was first the first year or so, I was literally just doing this all the time. And um, the, the trick, so in this case, these are the elevated leads, V2 and V3, they, the numbers line up. These are septal leads, these are anterior, and these are lateral. We always call the front of the heart first. So this person has, is having an anterior septal MI. If it was four and five, we always call the front of the heart first. It would be an anterior lateral MI, anterior lateral, anterior septal. If it was just one and two, it's a septal. If it was just three and four, anterior, just five and six lateral. That is that confusing? No, pretty simple. The confusing part really is that side of the strip, the augmented voltage. Trying to remember this part is all you really have to, so if you know septal, anterior, and lateral, and the numbers just have to line up, then we just want to focus on this. So I want you to start with this shape right here. To me, what does it look like? What does it look like to you? What's that shape look like? A boot, a boot, or a foot. And where's it located on the strip? On the lower left side. This lead is located in the lower left foot. It's the three leads in one. Those are the inferior leads, two, three, and AVF. So it's shaped like a foot, F for foot or F for inferior, shaped like a foot. 60% of your heart attacks are inferior mice. And remember, inferior mice cause Brady dysrhythmias. They can be preload dependent. And I'm going to use caution with nitro. When I'm looking at the pedals in my car, if I step on a pedal with my left foot, uh, what am I going to step on? The brake, left foot. No clutch, cheap people, who are people with stick drivers. So it's a brake. So I think of my left foot, the, the brake, inferior my is brady dysrhythmias, preload dependency. They circle, circle, circle the drain, and then they die. If I step on a pedal with my right foot, it's the gas. This side over here, even though it looks like it's the left side of the strip, you have to think of it from the per patient's, or, or it looks like the right side of the strip. You have to consider it from the patient's perspective. But if I step on a pedal with my right foot, it's the gas. They have tacky dysrhythmias, V-fib, V-tac, die fast. So the only thing left is this shape over here. And to me, I just picture a left shoulder. And that's where that leads at. It's out on the left shoulder. It's one and AVL. The R is for reference only. There are things that we do reference. Like if the patient is having a ventricular rhythm, normally R, AVR is the complete opposite of lead two. So if you see a little P wave, QRS and T wave, you will see the exact opposite view in AVR. So if it's a ventricular rhythm, AVR would be positive. So I'm only using AVR, not for calling STEMIs, but confirming ventricular rhythms. And then there's another one uh, I'll use AVR for, and that's the Scarbosa criteria, which is something else. All right, so now we know what we're looking for and where we're looking. We're gonna put them all together and we'll read some 12 leads real quick. Just remember this, the heart's writing you a letter. You just gotta be able to speak the language. We're gonna go lead at a time. You're gonna find a J point, compare it to a TP segment. 
and it's either elevated or not elevated. So don't pick a, a funky little beat. Don't pick a PVC or something weird. So like this one is actually a little bit better tracing than this one, but that's okay. I see the J point and I see the TP line. If it's not elevated, you go to the next one. If it is elevated, it's significant. So, so for this one, J point, TP line elevated? No, elevated. Oops, I don't know if you can see it on the side. See the elevation? Yes, that's significant, right? It's hard to tell, but it's just about a millimeter. Oops, I ran out of room around here. Yes, so I already know that these two leads, because it's shaped like a foot, are anatomically, anatomically contiguous. So what kind of MI, what kind of STEMI is this person having? An inferior MI. Inferior MIs, Brady dysrhythmias, preload dependency, be careful with nitro, too large bar IVs, give them some fluids. So I'm going to, but I'm going to keep going to see how big this thing is. This is the geographical location of the MI. It's on the bottom of the heart, right? R is for reference only. AVL. No. AVF. And we would suspect that one, right? Because it's part of this, it's part of those three leads. So let's go to V1. No, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. No. So this person's having an inferior mind. Before I gave the nitro, I'm going to slide a lead over here. I'm going to hit acquire again. At minimum, I'm going to do a 13 lead. But if I have time, I'll throw a couple on their back and do a 15 lead. That took like, what, 10 seconds to do? Okay, let's do this one. I don't know why I don't have the original one. Today. Okay, yes or no? Oh, that's, a, that's a no, sorry. Yes. I think it's elevated, but we don't have anything to go with it. So we just make note of it. No. Yep, my J point is up here where that little dot is like, I mark my J point right there. If you need to move in, you're welcome to come up closer. But yes, good golly, right? Yeah, so I know that these two are anatomically contiguous, so they're already positive for a STEMI, but we want to see how big this thing is. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I don't know. It's That's a little bump there, but I don't think so. And no. So what would we call this? We always call the front first. Anterior septal MI. And what are they at high risk for for anterior septal lateral MIs? TAC you just read this. V fib, V fast, V V fib, V tac, die fast. So there is, uh, I don't know how to draw on top of this. Um, is there a way to draw on top of this? I don't know how to do it, but I'll, I'll draw this a little after while we're on lunch break. I'll draw this. I don't know how to screenshot it, but I'll make it happen. This is what that intervention. So, uh, the good thing about the classes I was teaching was for 68 whiskeys. Does anyone know what 68 whiskey is? So, before they were deploying, um, this is out of the wet side of McGrady, they invited me out there to teach 12 leads to 68 whiskeys before they did their deployment. So, I was just cycling out there a lot at the time, and um, and they would have cardiac interventionists from Providence coming out there to talk about this stuff. And so I got to spend a lot of time waiting for us to go on stage, you know, to talk to him. And I said, hey, tell me what you're looking at when you see a 12 lead. He goes, sure. So I hand him a 12 lead. He draws a circle right here. And he writes aorta. And then off this side, he loops it around like this. He draws a left coronary artery going just like that. Coming off of that, he writes left circumflex. The left circumflex comes over to here. And off the right side, he draws a big C-shaped right coronary artery. So when, he, when the cardiologist is looking at your 12 lead, the interventionist, he's looking at where the blockage is, where he needs to float the wire and squirt the dye to place a stent. So he, he'll, he will know that this person has a proximal left coronary artery occlusion. So the, the occlusion is high up on the left side. It's called a widow maker. 
right? And this person's at high risk, right, for VFib, VTAC. So these are the ones, when I run that 12 lead and I get that, um, I'm going to go ahead and start care, calling for a helicopter, moving towards a PCI center. And guess what? I'm sticking those DFib pads on their chest and I'm ready, right? All I got to do is charge and shock boop, and, they're, and I'm, I'm toasting them. But I'll draw that out and I'll have it available for you. And these are just blow ups of that, those elevations. Elevation, elevation, and everyone can see where the J points are. J point, J point, J point. Everyone's good with that, right? J point. So just a couple of these and we're gonna go to lunch. Yes or no? Nope. Does this meet the criteria for STEMI? As far as you know currently, because we're gonna talk about imposters later? Yes. And what kind of STEMI are they having? Inferior am I. What are they at risk for? Brady dysrhythmias, preload dependency. I'm gonna start two hours of IVs and start giving some fluids. And if you start looking at these rates, 300, 150, 175, 60, so the rate's like 62. That's another interesting point. If you walk into the room, someone's got chest pain, shortness of breath, and they look like they're sick and they're in pain, right? Uh, nine over 10 pain. And you check a pulse and it's like 70. Well, pain equals what? Tacky, that's right. Pain equals vasoconstriction and tacky rhythms. So you would have to ask yourself, why is their pulse only 65 or 70? Is it because they're on beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, something to choke the rate down? Or then maybe they have a demand pacer, you know what I mean? The pacer's running, or they have an inferior mind. So that's where my brain starts going when I'm like, even just walking in the room and say, hey, my name is Merlin, I'm a paramedic, and I feel your pulse. If it's really fast, I'm like, oh shit, they're probably having a left-sided, uh, you know, left coronary artery occlusion, like high risk for dying on me. Okay. So we did that, no, no, yes, no, 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 uh-oh, yes, yes. So what will we call this? Yes, an inferior lateral infarction. So not only do they have some right coronary artery blockage over here, they also, remember that I, I drew the left coronary artery going this way and then the circumflex, They've got some involvement with that circumflex also. We're going to talk about SC depression on the next module. But that's called SC depression, uh, which would be reciprocal changes to inferior leads. But we're going to talk about reciprocal changes on our next thing. Oh, yeah. That's okay. This is the right coronary artery. So if you picture that aorta setting right here and the right coronary artery comes off like a big C, shaped like a big C. So there's occlusion in that right coronary artery and it's showing as an inferior MI. Well, I say that you don't know until you actually do the V4R that it's probably right ventricular infarction. It's definitely inferior. And then this side over here, that left circumflex, which also does feed the bottom of the heart. Okay, yes. Now I know, because I'm a cheater and I've been doing it for a while, that its anatomical neighbor is right here. If you haven't made that leap yet, just go lead at a time. Does everyone understand this leads over there? So I'm gonna go straight to its anatomical lead neighbor. Yes, so this person already meets the criteria for a STEMI, but we're gonna see how big it is. No, it's actually depressed, depressed, depressed. And maybe look at that though, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Definitely, definitely, yep, and no. So, what would you call that? Well, let's call the front first with so an anterior septal with lateral involvement. So that occlusion is really high up because it's affecting the left anterior descending coronary artery and it's also got left circumflex in there. So that's another one that will, these people over here, tacky dysrhythmia is VFib, VTAC, die fast. Everybody good with that? Shannon, before we take lunch, what you got for them? I'm gonna pause this recording.
You guys have, you guys have great memories. You'll figure it out. And it's a balancing act. I don't want to get too crazy with all this stuff on you guys, but we'll take our times and work our way through it. All right, so elevated or no? That's reference only. Okay. And I don't know about that one. No, no, no. So do we have two anatomically contiguous leads? So does that meet the criteria for STEMI? So AHA says, if you don't see it, you keep doing serial 12 leads. So every five to 10 minutes, we'll just hit another, which your monitor probably has already set up to do every 10 minutes or whatever. So just hit another. So what if this person has chest pain, shortness of breath, diaphoresis, are they having a heart attack? Probably, right? We'll treat them like they are. So it's not an exclusion criteria. And that's one of the things the Heart Association was worried about when they, they put these the 12 lead capability on the street. They didn't want paramedics to go out there and triage people and put the leads on them and go, no, nah, you don't need to go to hospital. You're not having a heart attack. Sign right here. Because <laughs> it first off, it's only you know 50% sensitive. And secondly, they could be having a heart attack. They just don't have elevation changes. What they will have before the elevation, though, is axis deviation. So it could tip you off. You know what I'm saying? That's why I like axis deviation so much. It's easy to learn. And I can check it real quick right here. Lead two is my most positive lead, which I'm going to look at lead one and three. It's going the same. Everything's moving through that heart the way it should be. You know what I'm saying? Because I don't have any deviation of axis, which means I don't have any strain or damage. It's flowing right on down the lead two, just like it should. And that's why lead two is my most positive lead. Yeah, once we hit, well, that's where I think we just had one. That uh, here's some axis deviation here. You have a positive lead one and a mostly negative lead three, so it's deviated up to the left. The one that one has no axis deviation, but it is an inferior MI. Not really here. Uh, we'll see. No, no, no reference only, narrow, hardly anything on that one. That's almost electrical neutral there. I think so. Oh, wait a minute, though. This one, that's weird, huh? It's depressed, 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 no, and no. So this one doesn't meet the criteria for a STEMI because it doesn't have two anatomically contiguous leads, um, but it has depressed ST segments in the anterior leads. So you would assume that the posterior leads, the opposite view, are elevated. But the only way to confirm it is to stick the leads on their back, right, V8 and V9, which I'll show you where they go. And then you run it again, and you can confirm it's a posterior MI. What you got? That's some big axis deviations, yeah, from halfway across the room. So this one here, positive lead three, negative, I'm sorry, positive lead one, negative lead three. So which way is it deviating towards? Well, I want you to read the top of it there. <laughs> you could also use your thumbs. So consider your thumb, your left thumb lead one and your right thumb lead three. So lead one is pointed up and lead three is pointing down. So you have left axis deviation. And what are the causes of the left axis deviation? It's obesity, pregnancy, hypertension, childhood, or bad things. And from the looks of this, it's probably something bad because they have notched QRSing, QRSs. So they probably have a bifascicular block. Does it say it on there? No. Oh, it does. well, look, oh, it says sinus rhythm with first degree AV block. And then we have left axis deviation, left bundle branch block. And somebody was asked about the turn signal method. Pass that around so you can see it. And look at lead V1. It shows you it's pointed down, and that's the left back, the left funnel branch block. So like everything is like block, block, block. The, you could kill that person pretty easy by giving them anti dysrhythmic medications. Okay, let's get on to the next one. 
Now, I think Shannon's going to make these slides available to y'all. They're on our instructor drive. And I don't know where she dumps them for y'all, if it's like a Google Classroom or Brady or whatever. Or if you have a thumb drive, I'm happy to uh, I'm happy to dump them on a thumb drive. All right, this is part two, module two. How about QRS changes with a STEMI, evolution of acute MI, reciprocal changes, and the imposters. And then basically we're gonna throw in the imposters in our systematic approach to reading 12 leads. So we'll start with the waveforms. This is purely academic, just so you know. I don't, you can turn your brain off if you want, whatever. That is an R wave. It's the first positive deflection above the baseline after the Q wave. The Q wave is the preceding negative deflection and the S wave is the following negative deflection. So in this case, there is no Q wave, which normally you don't have Q waves. So this is technically an RS complex. And because the R is bigger, you would document a big R, a little less. Just telling you this so you know, the reason I really did all of this is to get to a QS complex because I got tired of paramedics saying we have negative R waves. It's not, that's, that's not a thing, it's impossible. So this is a QS complex, a little Q, big S. I'm just gonna rip through this. QRS, RS, big R, a little less. This is technically, because I also heard people calling a notched QRS as a, as an RSR, unless it goes negative, it's not an S wave. So if you have two, like a notched, uh, a notched QRS complex, it's just an R, R wave. It's an R, R wave. Uh, uh, and the second R is the R prime. So anyway, purely academic. This is why I put that on there. This is technically called, this is a QS complex. And those QS complexes can show you where they had an old MI. The only evidence of uh, dead myocardial cells is the presence of a pathological, a pathologic Q wave. It can't go through it all. So that, what, yeah. So what happens is that muscle turns into a hardened plug and it doesn't participate in the pumping of the heart or the movement of electricity. So it's just like a scar tissue plug that's in the heart. So these are the normal um, waveform changes. Of course, variations do happen. This is our initial rhythm, but look, hey, look, there's some first degree AV block. It's not supposed to be there, but that's the, unfortunately the one it chose. Nothing's happening here. You got P waves, PRIs, QRS, nice and tight, P waves. The first thing that happens is elevation of the T wave, which also looks like hyperkalemia, but this precedes any clinical signs and symptoms. The next thing, so that's called the hyperacute phase. And this is what they're looking for when like that, the old man on the treadmill, and they're looking for S, their segment changes. They're looking for the, L, the T wave to start to elevate. Then they stop the test. They failed the stress test. Then you get into this ST segment. Where's the guy with his uncles, the cardiologist? Oh, man. Perfect opportunity for him to show everything he knows. So ST segment elevation. So the, um, now the acute phase, not the hyperacute, but acute ST segment elevates. Now there's enough lactic acids built up that they're having chest pain and symptoms. And this is also when they're candidates for uh, repolarization or sorry, reperfusion through balloon angioplasties and et cetera. So they're going to a cath lab. The next thing that happens is some of those cells start to actually die. So this is just ischemia. And then this is death of cells. And this is called a Q wave infarct. So if you hear um, an old paramedic trying to be fancy, if they hear say the term Q wave infarct, that just means there's a Q wave present with an infarction. And this means it's been going on long enough that you've actually had dead cardiac cells. And that will end up turning into a pathologic um, QS complex and it stays with them forever. So when you're looking at, I don't know if I got a 12 lead on here next. Yeah, here you go. So look at these. When you see these negative, these uh, QS complexes, where are they at? Where did they have their heart attack in the past? They had an old inferior MI, and we would call that age undetermined. So if there's no, if there's no ST segment elevation present, but they have signs and symptoms, we would call this um, age undetermined. And it'll actually say that across the top of your 12 lead. And I've had paramedics like rip it off and go, I put in there, they're 65 years old. Well, it's the age of the infarct 
not the age of the patient. <laughs> Isn't it crazy? But, and you can see, look, they have some left axis deviation because they've got damage down at the bottom of the heart. So it's deviating up to the left side. Lead one's positive, lead three's negative, left axis deviation. Okay, everyone's got that. Boop, 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 boop. So that's just kind of how the evolution of this acute MI is going to look like. Do you want to answer these questions? You don't have to. Uh, what, when a coronary artery occludes, you observe tall peak T waves. What phase are we in? Hyperacute. Bam. SC cellular elevation begins at what phase? The acute phase. When you're unable to determine the age of the infarct, Age undetermined. Bam, let's talk about reciprocal changes. I don't want you to, you don't have to memorize these numbers, just that it's not 100%. So you don't always have reciprocal changes. So therefore, reciprocal changes are not required to determine whether or not it's a STEMI. But I will tell you this, the imposters do not cause reciprocal changes. So it's, it's only a confirming, like if you think someone's having a STEMI and you see reciprocal changes, it's like confirming uh, evidence that they are having a STEMI. And if you have to wake the cath lab team up at, you know, four o'clock in the morning on Christmas Eve to come in and you have reciprocal changes, they'll forgive you if it's not actually a STEMI. But if you come in there with an imposter and there's no reciprocal changes, they will hate you forever. They're like, put a wanted poster up there, -chunk, you know, Michael Blackman, blah, blah, blah. And they'll throw darts at you every day. What's that? Repolarization. Is that a yes, I got a module on that next. Have reciprocal changes. No. So if you had BER in the presence of reciprocal changes, it's probably a heart attack, probably STEMI. But we'll do BER next. This is quite lengthy, so it'll probably be after a break. So reciprocal changes. Let's get it. Get some of this. All right. So in this case, we have ST segment elevation. And then over here, you see we have depressions. And when I learned this, I would just take my ink pen and I would put it on my actual strip, like wherever your strip went. And if it got pushed up over here, I should see depressions over there. And if it got pushed up on this side, I should see depressions down here. So it's literally inferior leads versus everything else. Or I call it the little guys versus the world. And that's the seesaw metaphor, just like a little seesaw. Elevations, depressions. The way reciprocal changes works, the area looking at the damage shows elevations, and then the opposite view shows the depressions. So it's just like if me and Shannon were at the football game, and she's at one end zone, and I'm at the other end zone, and the play's at the 50-yard line, and we'll say the Clemson player is scoring a touchdown towards <laughs> Shannon, she's going to see that player get bigger. So she has elevations. I'm looking at the exact same play, but in the opposite direction, and they're going to get smaller for me. I'm going to show depressions. Boop, boop. That's how reciprocal changes work. Two, three in AVF versus anything else. So that's why I put my ink pen right there on the word AVL. It's where I stick my, my pencil, and uh, that's where I use my seesaw metaphor. So if I have elevations over here, what leads would I see depressions in? T3 and AVF, AVL, lead one, V1, V2, everything, right? Bam. And if I have, uh, so that's this one. So if you have elevations in T3 and AVF, you should see depressions and the other leads somewhere. So in this case, I put my little ink pen right here on that word AVL. It's pushed up on this side. I should see depressions over here. And sure enough, I got depressions. It's just confirming evidence that this person is having a STEMI because imposters don't cause reciprocal changes. So in this case, what kind of, what kind of STEMI do we have? Inferior MI, right? Preload dependent, bradyus arrhythmias, careful with your nitro. I do a 15 lead uh, before I give nitro. Two 16 gauge IVs, start some fluids. Or whatever, two large bores. 16 is kind of extreme, but you know what I mean. All right, so in this case, I have elevations on that side, so I should see depressions over here. Pushed up over there, pushed down over here. 
uh, V1, V2, V1, V2, V3, a little bit in V4. So it just pushes my pencil up, which means I should see depressions over here. That's depressed, depressed, and depressed. So I'm like, cool. So this right here is anterior septal. So they have an anterior septal MI, and they're at high risk for tachydysrhythmias and V-fib, V-tac die fast. So these patients are going to die fast on you. These patients are going to die slow. Therefore, you see the slow death ones in our truck more. That's why you see the inferior MIs more. All right, so two, three in AVF versus everything else. So in this case, it's elevated on over here. Look at that, massive, bam, depressed over here. So what kind of stimmy is this? Anterior septal with lateral involvement. Yep. That's a big one, right? That's a going to be a proximal occlusion. Won't take much for them to get into VTAC, VFib, and die. So this one's pushed up on this side, C3 and AVF. So it's depressed over there. This one's pushed up on that side. You got depressions over here. Whoop, whoop. This one or that, this one? Okay. You got elevations in two, three, and AVF. And then you got depressions here, here, and there. So depress, depress, there's depressions over here. Yep. That's called the seesaw metaphor. Which is up on this side, means it's going to go down over there. The ST segment would be depressed. Yeah, like you can see here, the T way is positive, but the yeah. ST segments, yeah, depressed. Everybody good with that? <clears throat> so who cares about reciprocal changes? Like I said, I, I think that you'll be forgiven if you show up with an imposter with reciprocal changes versus if you show up with an imposter without reciprocal changes. It just strengthens your case for this is a STEMI. So let's see, which of the following is possible cause of SP segment depression? Could it be myocardial ischemia, digitalis, or reciprocal changes? Or all the above? All of the above. Oop, everything can cause that. Uh, using the seesaw metaphor, if you have elevations, there's reciprocal changes, a module, let's see, which leads oppose one and AVL? Two, three, and AVF, little guys versus the world. Excellent. All right. So let's talk about doing, getting a 15 lead. So to get a 15 lead, we're going to move V4 to the right side of the chest. It's the same intercostal space, midclavicular. It's kind of right where the breast meets the wall of the chest, where they like to hide paper clips and make cheese and things. That's where it goes. And then you're going to pop five and six off, leave the actual electrode in place, but pop the wires off. And then same horizontal plane at the tip of the scapula and halfway to the spine, you're going to put five and six, but they're now called V8 and V9. And then you're going to hit acquire again. And as soon as it prints up, so here's our initial one. So you can see, I don't really see too much there. Um, so this, in this case, they had a clean 12 lead, and they said, you know what? Let's look at the back of the heart, too. Look at the right side of the back. So they did it again. As soon as it prints up, I usually just write a big R right here, and then I mark these out and put V8, V9. So look at V8. So the right ventricle for V4R is good, but look at V8 and V9. So they're having a posterior STEMI. So if we go back to here, there is a little bit of some depressions in those anterior leads, but it's not pronounced, right? If you weren't looking, you might not even see it. So they had a relatively clean 12 lead. They did a 15 lead and the right ventricle is fine, but the back of the heart is a STEMI. Derp. Oop, back one wrong way. So in this case here, look at this, we have a big, inferior MI, 
Everybody's good with that, right? So before they gave Nitro, they went and did a 15 lead. And they just wrote R up here. I like to write 15 lead up here, R. Mark these out, V8, V9. So they do have elevation. So they have an inferior posterior MI. That's not confusing, right? Reciprocal changes are not confusing. Is anyone lost on this? Excellent. There is another way to learn, like I say all leads is one. And another way that I learned it was called pales. Um, and when you look at the word pales, it tells you the opposites of each other. But it's, to me, it's easier to just remember the little guys, two, three, AVF, inferior leads versus the world. But just to, to say it, so you can't say I didn't cover it. Pales means posterior, anterior, anterior, inferior, inferior, lateral, lateral, septal. It's too much. But if you did this, it's I see all, or I see all leads, whatever. This is posterior, anterior, inferior, lateral, septal. That's why I, I don't get deep into it because it's if you already know one method, you don't have to worry about it. Let's get through these. Um, is oh, we're on a break. Let's take a break. It's been an hour. It's been an hour already. Any questions on the break here? All right. Have I lost anyone on anything so far? I understand we're still building blocks on this thing and it's okay. Is there anyone that needs me to stop what I'm doing and go back to J points or elevation? Okay. Everyone understands coronary arteries? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, absolutely. And everyone understands that coronary arteries are the only arteries in the body that perfuse while the heart's at rest. Everyone understands that, right? Okay, good. We all know it's a four chambered pump. We know things, right? I'm just making sure. All right, so let's talk about, what were we talking about? Oh, we're, we're getting into imposters now. So is an MI the only cause of ST segment elevation? No. Like you mentioned, we have benign early repolarization, which I do have a thing on that. And um, and I'm glad we do. Like the, the last one we flew from Shaw, and I don't think Tim Curvin minds me saying it. Tim Curvin flew them. It was BER. And when I came in the next day, I was like, hey, you flew one out list. So let me look at the strip. And I just lost it. When I saw the strip, I was like, what are you doing? And um, so I gave it to him, man. <laughs> His point was the doctor called it a STEMI, and who is he to say it's not? Well, I don't know. I, he he does have a point. The physician is a physician, but and I don't cook in other people's kitchens, but um, I would have put him in my truck and just took him downtown. But listen, I think he, uh, I and I have nothing but respect for Tim. He is one of the best paramedics in the state, in my opinion, and um, he's the top flight paramedic in the world. So. I understand what he's saying. I just disagree with it. And you know what? It's okay. It's okay to disagree with each other. So what are some other causes of ST segment elevation? Oh, Lord. Well, I don't know what I'm doing here. Let's see. Bundle blindness blocks can do it. Why is that? Correct. Elect. There we go. So yeah, there are imposters out there. And, um, and we're going to talk about the top three. We'll talk about four, but we'll talk about more. But I'm going to teach you at least how to do LVH, bundle branch blocks, and ventricular pace rhythms. But I'll tell you, th this list could go on out that door, right? It could be a long list. And, um, but let's just talk quickly talk about pericarditis. Pericarditis is, a, is an inflammation, right, around the sack of the heart there. And you'll have global elevation in all your leads. And I've seen it in the field. You have like a 70-year-old or 67-year-old and they'll have a little bit of a fever. You put them on a 12 lead and you're like, oh my God, <laughs> they're having a massive MI. If you have elevations in like six or more leads, it's going to be pericarditis. And that's exactly what it is. Pericarditis, every lead's elevated. It looks like a global MI. It's an infection around the heart there. We're going to talk about benign early repolarization. Intracranial bleeds can and can look like STEMIs also. 
But if you can just learn the top three, and I'm going to show you BER to make the top four or uh, the fourth one, then you'll knock out the lion's share of imposters. You won't be on the wanted board with, on the dark board every day, you know, at the cath lab. And uh, I think you'll make it through your career, um, or at least the start of your career, smoothly. So left ventricular hypertrophy is just an enlargement of the left ventricle, and it usually happens secondary to high blood pressure that's been untreated or undiagnosed. So the ventricle, every time it pumps, is in, to increase vascular resistance, and it gets more uh, muscular and muscular because it's like it's constantly working out and it becomes this really big honking muscular ventricle. And the electrical impulse has to go the same distance or further distance in the same amount of time. So it has these giant amplitudes. Bundle branch blocks is a wide complex, often notched QRS. And we're talking usually the left bundle branch. There is a way to determine these that we can talk about a simplified Scarbosa. I don't want to screw you guys up today. It's a lot of information. We might brush over it. I don't want to kill you with it. But bundle branch blocks off on the left side will also cause ST segment elevation, like Mr. Bachman pointed out. And then, also, and then ventricular rhythms, often paced, those have wide complex rhythms. So by telling, that, telling you that, when you see a wide complex rhythm present, there is an imposter present. So if you have a wide QRS, there's an imposter. And we have to use that Scarbosa criteria if you're going to determine whether or not it's a STEMI. Or if you have the capability, we don't at Shaw, I don't know if Sumter does, or I don't know if Florence's capability. Maybe you can transmit it in and have someone else say yes or no. We can't get that where I'm at. It is outside of the reach of technology of the United States Air Force currently. So this is just another view of those bundle branches. We have a left bundle branch. What's that? Exactly. <laughs> we uh, we had to use a fifth gen fighter against a one a gen one balloon. Um, the right side doesn't have the hemifascials. The left side does. So you have posterior and anterior hemifascials. We have already talked about this. Um, the hemifascials. We've already brushed over axis deviation, and I don't expect you to know the numbers. It's just important to realize that there's an increase in mortality when you have axis deviation in the presence of symptoms of an acute MI. This left axis deviation, it's four times. So if you had a 20% chance of dying, now you have an 80% chance of dying. And with right axis deviation, because right's not right, it increases your chance of death by 70%. So if you had a 20% chance of dying, now you had a 90% chance of dying. So these are just all things that I would appreciate if I was a young paramedic. If someone was to come up to the back doors and just crack the door up and go, early, um, they probably gonna die fast. <laughs> I'd be like, thank you. I appreciate that because I needed all the help I could get. Um, pace rhythms, ventricular rhythms, they just cause wide complexes and you'll have a little pacer spike. So as soon as I'm looking at this and I see the wide complex rhythm, I know that there's an imposter present. I don't even read the rest of the 12 lead. Um, I'm going to go, what's the imposter? This is a pace rhythm. And then now I can only use the Scarbosa criteria if I know it. But I will tell you something inter as interesting when I was on, Dr. Warnsman, I was up at Toomey kissing somebody's butt. And um, they, because uh, we had the contract at the time. So that's what your job is. If you don't want to kiss butt, then don't get involved in any of those contracts. So I'm up there walking the halls and someone said, hey, are you here for the STEMI in 10? I said, no, but I love to watch a good STEMI. So I went into room 10, there's uh, Dr. Wormsman's in there. And um, and if you ever want to unnerve a doctor, just call him by their first name. Hey, Eric, what have we got? And it catches them off guard. Like, oh, well, who are you? Michael, nice to meet you. So I'm looking on the thing and they're having a massive inferior MI, which is a really good one, right? So I was like, ooh, look at those tombstones. And um, so he goes, yeah, I can't call it. It's a paste rhythm. I said, what? So I looked at his, uh, you know, the big piece of paper they have. I said, oh, crap, it is a pace rhythm. I think like, I got it. I know what's going on. He's like, what is it? I said, well, inferior mice causes Brady dysrhythmias. So it's choking that rate down and choking the rate down. And then the pacer kicks in. It's a demand pacer, right? So once that rate drops below, what, 65? It's going to kick it back up to 70. Boom, boom, the pacer kicks in. So that's when I told him, I told you a story. I said, hey, just interrupt the pacer and then hit a choir. He goes, are you crazy? I said, no, I would do it. I said, like, give me a donut. I'll do it right now. You just to hold the donut over the pacer and it disconnects it, right? And then you hit acquire. 
He said, you ain't got the balls to do that. I would, Give me the donut. He wouldn't let me do it. So I said, I would call, I would call um, over to Columbia because I'm sure they're going to want that patient in a cath lab. It's obvious to me they're having an inferior MI. It's just being covered over when the pacer kicks in. And they did. They finally got a cardiologist on the phone after 20 minutes and they're, oh, yeah, get them over here as quick as you can. So that's just something to keep think of is if someone is having chest pain, shortness, breath, diaphoretic, and have a demand pacer, it might be covering that inferior MI up, right? But unless you know some scarbosa criteria, you can't call it. You're not going to tell unless you know scarbosa criteria, or at least you can't call it. You're going to treat them like they're having an acute MI with the pacer, and then you're going to take them to me. Maybe the pacer turns off, and then you can acquire it. But unless you can do that, you need to know the scarbosa. That's your question. You sometimes you can still see them. Yep. <clears throat> sometimes if they're very faint, you can rely on those arrows, but you'll still see pacer spikes. So the long and the short of this one is when I see a wide complex rhythm, I go, hold up. That may right. There's an imposter present. And in this case, I see the pacer spikes. So I know it's a, a ventricular pacer. And we'll brush over Scarbosa, but um, you can't call that a semi unless you have additional training. In this case, as soon as I see that wide complex rhythm, hold up, something's not right. And I see pacer spikes. So I could use the Scarbosa criteria to determine whether that is or is not a semi. The, the problem you, I have run into with Scarbosa is the markets that I'm working in, which is Clarendon and Toomey, those are the predominant, the hospitals, whatever the word is, I go to, right? When I say these things to them, they do not know what I'm talking about. So if, um, for an example, I have a patient that's got, uh, presents with an acute MI, and I'll say, I've acquired a 12 lead. It's showing a pace rhythm. The patient does not meet Scarbosa criteria. It's not a STEMI. And then they'll go, what the heck is he talking about? You know what I mean? Like they have no clue what you're saying. So you have to know your audience, if that makes sense. And another thing I've seen, at, at least at Clarendon, is if I call in and I say, the patient has an imposter present, they think it's a STEMI. So what I do, I've learned to do, like at Clarendon anyway, is I don't even mention it. If I have um, SC segment elevation and it's due to left ventricular hypertrophy, and I know it's not a STEMI, there's no reciprocal changes. I just tell them they're negative for a STEMI. And then I'll talk to a doctor about it. I don't mess with the charge very much because I'm bougie. So there's our pacer spikes. Top three, LVH, final rest blocks, and pace rhythms. There is, so we probably don't need to run a 12 lead on VTAC because it's a wide complex rhythm. Um, that's one of the occasions where I use AVR. See how AVR is positive? That confirms that, yes, this is ventricular tachycardia. But we really just wasted 10 seconds of not shocking that patient. So I don't think that's very smart to do. But hey, maybe they weren't sure if it was AFib with RVR versus VTAC. I don't know. They probably had a good reason they could do it. <laughs> so. Let's talk about left ventricular hypertrophy. Is it LVH or is it not LVH? So in this case, we can see some ST segment elevation over there. We have these giant amplitudes. Look, here's some elevations here and here. But look, there's no reciprocal changes. And I know LVH is on the top of my list. So I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna check them for LVH. It's called the LVH three step. First thing we do is we make sure, and you will now notice that every 12 lead has a 10 millimeter deflection at the front of them. It's called a calibration. So this one is calibrated correctly. We have a 10 millimeter calibration. So now every time you see a 12 lead, now you'll notice the calibrations on there. So it is calibrated, which means it's in times one. We haven't zoomed in on it or zoomed out to see what the rhythm is. So we haven't messed with the, um, the voltage on it. So I made sure I had that calibration and then I go to V1 and V2 and I compare them and I look for the biggest or deepest amplitude. In this case, V2 is deeper. I count the number of little blocks, 21. And then I look at V5 and V6. I look for the biggest one. In this case, it was V5. I count the little blocks and I add them together. If it's greater than 35, it meets the voltage requirement for LVH. The good thing about this is most of the cardiac monitors are really good at determining LVH. It'll have it at the top. 
Yep. So let's go back to that first strip. So I look at V1 and V2. V2 is bigger than V1. And I start counting 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 26. So I write down 26. And then I look at V5 and V6. V5 goes all the way up to here. Can you see that? All the way up to there. So um, that's more like four, but we'll start here. 5, 10, 15, 20. Oops. Hold on. 5, 10, 15, 18, plus 4, 22. 22 plus 26 is greater than 35. So this is LVH. And we do have the elevations, but we don't have the depressions. This is a STEMI imposter. So it just meets the voltage criteria for LVH. What you do is you compare, yeah, you compare V1 and V2, get the deepest amplitude or the highest one, and then you go to V5 and V6 and compare those and take this. So we got another example. Got it there. So this is just a zoom in on those V1 and V2, and V2 was bigger. So when we start counting 5, 10, 15, 20, 24, we write down 24. And then we look at V5 and V6, and I think V6 was bigger. 5, 10, 15, 21. So 21 plus 24, greater than 35. So they meet the voltage requirement for LVH. Yes. This either the deeper or the bigger amplitude. Just their amplitudes. And that just reminds you that if you sus suspected an MI before you did the 12 lead, regardless of the result of the 12 lead, we just have to treat them like they're having a heart attack because the cardiac monitor is not 100% accurate. It doesn't detect all of them. And that's why they do labs, so they can pull some troponins and stuff. So you should suspect left ventricular hypertrophy when the QRS complexes are especially deep or tall, tall and narrow, short and narrow, or short and wide. Tall and deep, right? Tall or and or deep, and then it's going to be thirty-five or more, correct? So all we're going to do uh, that's different now that you know the top three imposters. When we go do our systematic analysis before we make our final interpretation, we just rule out those top three imposters, which we already know if it's a Y complex, right? So we're really identifying Y complexes in the presence of LVHs. It's not hard at all. This is just information we've already gone over. This is our list of imposters. We're going to rule those out. And then we're going to come up with our final determination. It's either going to be a STEMI, not a STEMI, or a definite maybe. So a definite maybe means we, we can't tell. We need expert consultation. And hopefully you have definite maybe protocols. Stuff like you're going to fax it or not fax it, or transmit it off for interpretation. In this case, we have elevations, we have depressions, and before I call it a um, a STEMI, I'm going to say, do I have any wide complex rhythms? No. Do I have any giant amplitudes? No. So this is a STEMI. So I would put that in my STEMI box. This one, as soon as I see this wide complex QRS, I know there's an imposter present. It's either going to be a pace rhythm or a bundle branch block because you see the notching on the QRS. And in this case, Chipley, was it a left or a right bundle branch block? No, it's a left bundle branch block. Did you just guess both of them just to see? No, I'm uh, looking at, looking at, uh, look at V1. And then from V1, if it's pointed down, it's like turning your turn signal to the left. And then if it's pointed up, it's turning to the right. So this is a left bundle branch block. The only way we can call this a STEMI is if you know a simplified version of Scarbosa. And it is extremely simple. The only two things you'll look, do you want to know what they are? The only two things you're looking for with Scarbosa is ST segment elevation, 
that is in the same direction as the QRS in any lead. So even AVR. So if I can find one single lead that has SC segment elevation going in the same direction as the QRS, this is a STEMI. So let me tell me if you see any a single lead that's sure. elevated. Are you back on the turn signal method? <laughs> yep. So back on determine left or right bundle branch block, you go to V1 and think of this as your, your steering wheel and your turn signals over here, right? So if you're going to turn left, which way are you going to turn your turn signal, up or down? Yep. So this is a left bundle branch block, which is a very classic imposter for STEMIs. And unless it's a brand new left bundle branch block, and you're not going to know that, they cannot go to the cath lab. Unless you know that the, the uh, Scarbosa criteria. Scarbosa, uh -huh. well, go ahead. That's okay. So, yeah. but, uh, Here? Okay. Lead one is pointed down. Okay. So for the turn signal method, you have to refer to lead V1. And if it's pointed down, it's like hitting your turn signal down. So this is a left funnel branch block. You on board with that? Everybody on board with that? So the only way I could determine whether this is is to apply two of the criteria, uh, a criteria from Scarbosa. The first criteria, criteria A, is SC segment elevation in the same direction as the QRS complex going up. This is SC segment elevation in the same direction as the QRS complex. Yes, so this is a STEMI in the presence of a bundle branch block because you use Scarbosa. And let's say we didn't see it, sir. Okay, so let's go back. So we know there's an imposter present, correct? We have a wide complex rhythm with notching. There's the notches. And well, we're gonna to check to see if it's a left or right bundle branch block. In this case, we went to V1, it's a left bundle branch block. Left bundle branch blocks are imposters. The only way you can determine whether or not it's a STEMI is to apply um, the Scarbosa criteria. So um, Dr. Scarbosa was from Argentina and they did a medical study to figure out how can we determine whether these bundle branch blocks and pace rhythms are STEMIs. And what the criteria they came up with was the first one is ST segment elevation in the same direction as the QRS positive in any lead at all, just one lead. It could have been an AVR. If AVR was positive with ST segment elevation, then it's a, then it's a STEMI. That's 80% um, accurate. So see how you got the ST segment in the same direction? Oh, okay. Yep, see, okay. yep, bam. No, no, with Scarbosa, because so to get there, we had to understand there was a wide complex rhythm, bundle branch block, and I can't call it a STEMI unless I use Scarbosa. And in this case, criteria A for Scarbosa is ST segment elevation and a QRS that are going in the same direction up in any lead, any one single lead. And that we have it in two leads, but we only needed it in one lead. Mm hmm. Yeah, with 80% accuracy, that would be a STEMI. So let's. So that's a, a good point is, let's say I wake up the cath lab team at three o'clock in the morning on Christmas Eve, right? I just ruined everyone's Christmas and it's not a STEMI. Well, there's a 20% chance it's not a STEMI, but there's an 80% chance that it is. So we can talk about that once I get there and they're pissed off at me when they find out that all the arteries are open. Of course, I'm going to be out running more calls, but... Um, but I can explain to anyone why I called that. And I could refer them back to Scarbosa. And they say, yeah, that does meet the criteria for Scarbosa. And it should be called a STEMI. Did I lose you on that? OK. And that's, that's for wide complex rhythms that we'd use Scarbosa. Yep. Criteria two is ST segment depression going down with a negative deflected QRS complex and only in V1, 2, or 3. So if you don't have that elevation, now you're going to, I, I turn my fingers like this. Right? So if this is going down in the same direction as the QRS complex, the, R, the QS complex, 
then that's the criteria B, the second criteria for Scarbosa. And I got some Scarbosa stuff on here. Let's see if I get into it. It ain't on there. Why is it not on there? That's okay. I'll find it. So hold on. So why complex rhythms are an imposter? Yep. It's either going to be a bundle branch block or it's going to be a pace rhythm. With Scarbosa, you can look at a wide complex rhythm. You can apply that to wide complex rhythms and determine with 80% accuracy whether it is a STEMI or not. I don't know why I don't have it on this. Maybe it's on the next group of slides, but I can't think of it being there. So criteria A is ST segment elevation in the same direction and any lead that's got to be going positive. In this case, we had it over here. And then criteria B is SC segment depression going the same direction as the QRS complex in V1, V2, or V3. So the real Scarbosa criteria, it's a simplified. The real one is a point system. And the first criteria is worth like five points. The second criteria B is worth three points. And the third one's worth two points. And the way Scarbosa was laid out, you have to have three or more points um, that you, because you add them up to be 80% specific for a STEMI. Well, if criteria A is five points, which this is, then you're greater than three. So you don't even need the other two. Second criteria is the ST segment depression with the QRS in leads V1, V2, or V3, you get three points. So that still meets the criteria. So why even learn the third criteria? Because it's only worth two points. So you don't need to learn criteria C because you wouldn't earn enough points for it to be called a STEMI. It would be like a 50-50 shot or third, no, it's 30%. So it would only be 30% specific if you only had criteria C. So why do that? We're not gonna do that. So in this case, we have some elevations. And we have some depressions over here. But then we look at this big, I don't know if we have depressions or not. Well, I didn't really look long enough. Oh, look at this one. So you see the wide complex with notching. So we're back to the same thing with Scarbosa because I know this is a bundle branch block and then I quickly look at V1, it's pointed down. So this is a left bundle branch block. I know it's an imposter. I'm gonna apply the Scarbosa criteria. I look for any ST segment elevation going in the same direction as the QRS complex going up. No, 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 no. So then I look for criteria B, which is ST segment depression in the same direction going down in V1, V2, and V3. No, no, no. So this would be an imposter. Or you could say it's a definite maybe, right? There's that 30% chance. I would send that off to the hospital for them to figure it out. I don't have that capability where I'm at. What's that? First criteria is any ST deflection. Elevation. Elevation in the same direction as the QRS going positive at any lead, that's right. And you only need one lead. You don't need more than one lead, just one, any one lead. I wonder if I have any, let me look and see if I have any, uh, oh, I'm going the wrong direction. Let's see if I have any, um, I went the wrong way for a long time. Let's see if I have any practice trips in here. I'll find some practice trips where we can uh, run through some. Man, has it been another hour already? Has it felt like an hour? Okay, well, let's do just a couple of these real quick. There's just two quick case studies. The first one is female patient. 
46 year old female, pulse is 88, blood pressure is 136 over 86, respiration is 14. Skin's warm and dry, depression takes Zoloft, off, and no toilet lead and triage. That's kind of crazy. So, but abdominal pain, discomfort, left shoulder and back pain. And we know that diabetics, females, they all present, right? They're aliens and they present differently, atypical. So we're gonna do a 12 lead, this is a little blurry, but I do a systematic analysis. I don't see any elevations. So I don't see a STEMI. So what do we do if we don't see a STEMI? What do you do if you don't see a STEMI? Do serial 12 leads, right? You just keep looking for it. So that was the recommendation that came out in 2005 or four, 2004. They just said, if it's non-diagnostic for a STEMI, do serial 12 leads every five to 10 minutes, a dynamic event. So that's what we do. Uh, there's nothing to see here. So it's not a STEMI. Are they having a heart attack? I don't know. We need to draw labs, right? We need to do some other things. But as far as we're concerned, they did not meet the criteria for a cath lab. 67-year-old male patient, hurting about it for at least an hour, got coronary artery disease, hypertension, other heart problems, emphysema, takes nitroglycerin, pulse of 70. So if he's in pain and you got a pulse rate of 70, it makes me go, hmm, I wonder if this is an inferior my or a pacer. You know, that's what I start thinking. Blood pressure is 150 over 90, which is probably normal for old Festus here. We'll get a 12 lead. And as soon as I see these wide complex rhythms, I know there's an imposter present. Can you tell which, which imposter it is? Yep. Can you tell if it's an anterior or a, a ventricular pacer? Or, I'm sorry, anterior, an atrial or a ventricular pacer? But it is, it's a, it's a ventricular pacer, yeah. You had a pacer spike and a QRS complex. So we have a pacer on board. If I apply the Scarbosa criteria, I look for elevation at any lead that is going up in the same direction um, as the QRS. No, no, no. These are all opposites, opposite, opposite, opposite. No, 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 no. So then I look at V1, 2, and 3 for ST segment depression going down with the QRS. No. So they do not meet the Scarbosa criteria for a STEMI. Is he having a heart attack? I don't know. It beats me. They need to draw labs. But we're going to treat him like whatever his symptoms are, right? We're going to do the holy trinity of paramedicine, IVO2 monitor, take him to the nearest referral center. All right, let's take a break. I'll find some Scarbosa stuff. What's that? Okay, this is the one on. Who doesn't know? All right, you're out of class. All right, you, you can't be a paramedic. Sorry. We have to, everyone needs to know that. Not, not everybody can be a paramedic. So and that's okay. I mean, if we were all paramedics, no one would ever clean the truck, right? No one would restock it. No one would clean it. So it's okay. All right, so benign early repolarization. BER, you'll have ST segment elevations, um, but you will not have any depressions. Look at those big old amplitudes. Um, so there's some elevation there, elevations, or see even some over there on that side, elevations, but there are no reciprocal changes. So the hallmarks of uh, BER are these big amplitudes. You have J waves, or some people call them fish hooks, and then peak T waves. There's your little J wave or fish hook. There's your peak T wave and these big amplitudes. So, and that's the little fish hook there. So, um, do some of these. It doesn't cause reciprocal changes. It doesn't widen out the QRS. It produces no clinical signs and symptoms of a heart attack. So this is a normal variant. 
the person on Shaw was up there for an annual physical. And part of that, they run a 12 lead. And the 12 lead popped out and said acute MI at the top. And then the doctor said, it's a STEMI. And, um, and they flew them out. So I'm not the protector of the, uh, you know, TRICARE budget, but, you know, $50,000 for a flight for a kid that doesn't need to go to the cath lab is ridiculous. And you're bumping other people who needed caths that day. You know what I mean? You're screwing up the schedule. It's embarrassing on top of everything else. Found a 1% of the U.S. population, usually 20 to 40-year-old men, a lot of them African-American, but the one we had the other, that time was a little white dude. And um, so do we have this population in our um, response areas? Absolutely. So this could be a normal variant that you're gonna see. Doesn't rule out an acute MI. So if they're having chest pain, shortness of breath, diaphoresis, we're gonna treat them like they're having a heart attack. You just can't call a STEMI off the BER. But if they do have elevations and reciprocal changes, well then by golly, because that normal variant can change in the presence of a STEMI. And if you don't know what to do, just definite maybe it, transmit it to your hospital and ask them what you want to do. Okay. That's right. So we don't, what we notice is the first thing that's probably going to catch our eye is we're going to be doing a systematic approach. We're going to go no, yes, eh, maybe, maybe not. No, 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 eh, on the edge. That's probably elevation. That's elevation. That's close. So we'll say, oh, it looks like they're having a heart attack or a STEMI. So before we uh, determine it, we want to knock out the top three STEMI imposters, LVH. And they probably do have LVH. 5, 10, 15, 24. This one goes all over here. 5, 10, 15, 20. 25, almost 30. So yeah, they meet the voltage criteria for LVH. So that in itself would be enough to say there's an imposter present. Um, but when I start noticing these, um, this right here, that fish hook, the J wave and the peak T waves, I'm like, this is probably BER. Yeah, I look for these. This is um, the typical characteristics. A J wave, some people call it a fish hook. A J wave, a peaked T wave, and big amplitudes. So it's this is just a normal variant. So it doesn't mean they're not having a heart attack. It just means they don't meet the criteria for the cath lab. Quick one. That's a quick, easy one. Oh boy, where did I get that from? Hey, you open that back up. All right, moving right along. So let's talk about electrode location uh, placement, our lead views. Um, unless someone wants to take the shirts off and get out their flapjacks, um, we'll probably withhold the demonstrations. But we will, I will talk about some stuff on this Life Pack 15, if you don't mind. I, I will um, I will tell you, like, and I'm not blaming you guys. Santa said it wasn't you guys. It was one of the other staff members here, but there's a saying on the helicopter, what are we without fuel? Pedestrians, <laughs> right? What's a paramedic without a cardiac monitor? A basic, that's right. So if we, we are death fighters and this is our rifle, right? Without this, we are not going to save people. Got to have the defibrillator. So I found this in really bad shape this morning in the in the ambulance room it's not your guys's fault i figured it'd be you guys touching it last and they had the the leads were all crammed in here and the cables were everywhere listen man um you should be the protector of this machine on your job and here because if this is not working i think the other day didn't they have someone have some cardiac issue it was you yeah um this thing needs to be ready to save your life right 
everybody else is here too. So make sure, I mean, I know we have an AED, but make sure this thing is good. And if you see people misusing it, be offended by it and take good care of it. It's your rifle, all right? So I'm gonna show you some things on there. I just think will help you out when you're trying to get someone to help you do your job. Firefighters are gonna to wanna to help, EMTs are gonna help, and you're gonna to need to use people to help you do these things. And that's the hardest part I think about being a paramedic is just, you're not a supervisor for the most part, but you're kind of asking someone to do work for you or with you, and it's not easy. Trying to get the other knucklehead, you know, to, to get in the same direction as you're going in. So we'll talk about some tips and some tricks and stuff. So these electrodes have to be placed in the correct location or your interpretive skills are no use. So we need to be able to get a, acceptable data for these 12 leads. You're getting um, 12 leads out of 10 electrodes, four on the limb, six on the chest. The limb lead position is pretty easy. They just need to go off the torso, out on the deltoids or lower than where the leg meets the trunk. Traditionally, we move the leads off the hands up to the shoulders and off the legs up to the thighs because the more they move those, it changes that um, the electrical compass that we've created, that Einthoven's triangle. So we try to keep them on the deltoids or at least lower than where the leg meets the trunk. And just to call back to this, we have our vertical leads and our horizontal leads. The vertical leads are all your limb leads and the horizontal leads, your transverse leads are your precordial leads or chest leads. The chest leads, three of them have anatomically anatomical placement that you have to meet, you have to hit, whatever. There's three of them that must be placed in the right location. That's V1, V2, and V4. Everything else is gonna be placed around those leads. And unfortunately, if you watch anyone who does, like you have EKG techs, they just literally slap them on their chest. They don't check for location. They're going about off the nipple line. That might be right, but it might be a little bit off. So I'm gonna show you the right way to do it. And then as you get really good at it, you'll be able to kind of suss out where that rib is and just kind of go straight to it. But at first, please try to at least find where it's supposed to be. For V1, it's, you got four fingers, that's how I remember it. It's the fourth intercostal space, right sternal border. V2 is on the left sternal border in the same fourth intercostal space, you got four fingers. V4 is the fifth intercostal space. It's gonna be mid clavicular. So you're gonna go down a rib and over, and it's pretty much where the, the breast meets the chest wall. That's where you want that lead. V3 goes halfway in between those two leads, where V3 goes. The anterior uh, axillary line is where your arm meets the chest. And now we want to start a flat horizontal plane going around the chest. So at the same level as V4, you're going to place V5 on the anterior axillary line. And then V6 is on the mid axillary line, same horizontal plane. So V1 and V2 are which, in, which intercostal space? Fourth. Excellent. Which electrode is in this, um, which electrode position here is shown? Can you tell which one it is? Ah, yeah, it's on the anterior axillary line. Or, yeah, yeah. Bam, I said it right. Whew. Has it what now? Well, I've, I've, because I'm clicking it. It's a good one, though. The, um, Here's somebody's battalion chief, I guarantee it. Um, but this is this is the most anatomical position is laying flat, but your patients are gonna be symptomatic and they're not gonna tolerate laying flat. So just keep them as low as you can, right? So maybe 30 degrees, um, try to get them low on the stretcher because the more they set up, the more the heart rides on the diaphragm. And as it rides up and down the diaphragm, you get these undulations through your waveforms. So it looks like it's riding on the ocean, you know what I mean? You also get that with dried out electrodes. It'll also give you those weird waveforms. There's a false intercostal space right underneath um, the clavicle up here. So you don't want to stick your finger in there thinking it's first intercostal space. But the easiest way I think to do it is you find that angle of Louis. It's right where the manubrium meets the sternal body. There's a little lump right there. That's where the second rib meets. So you find the lump and then you go over and down and you're going to be in the second intercostal space. And then you can kind of work your fingers down from there. So you walk up and you find the manubrium and there's a little lump right here. 
and then you go over and down, you're in the second intercostal space, third, and then fourth. So I just kind of put my finger on there and um, maybe there's a freckle or something that, or I could push really hard and then I'll stick lead on there. And right across from it, V2. That's that sternal angle of angle of Louis. Same thing here. Find the manubrium, go down and over, two, three, and four. And then V4, we're going to go down one more rib, mid clavicular. That's where V4 goes, fifth intercostal space. We'll backfill three. If we're going to do a 13 or 15 lead, we're going to remove V4 and we're going to put it on the right side over here. And that's now going to be V4R. So that's going to look at that right ventricle. To put the leads on the back, um, sorry about having V7 up there. V7 is actually now V4R. Um, V5 and V6, you're going to go tip of the scapula, halfway of the spine. Same horizontal plane as all those leads that were up here. So it's just like if you followed that line to their back, that's going to be V8 and V9. And when you hit acquire, you're going to write 15 lead on the top of the thing, write an R, and then it mark those out, but V8, V9. Don't follow the rib. Stay on a nice horizontal plane. Nice and flat all the way around. Sometimes it's hard to find the anterior axillary line, especially with obese patients. So just fill in V6. If you can't find this line, it's okay. Just go to the armpit, fill in V6, and then halfway to four, put V5, same horizontal plane. And you'll find that with bigger patients easier to do. Just have them kind of chicken wing their arm up, stick it in their armpit, and then halfway back to four. That's where you put V5. Uh, the sternal angle of the best corresponds with what location? Remember the sternal angle we just mentioned? Second, there you go. Hey, you got it right again. Which of the following electro placement has specific intercostal landmarks? Excellent, V1, V2, and V4. If you go really fast, it looks like the YouTube video that I took these screenshots off of. So with the battalion chief, whoever here, they found the fourth intercostal space, the V1. Sternal border, V2. They're going to then place V4, backfill three. V5 goes here in the anterior axillary line, and then V6 is in the maxillary line. So that is the most correct position. When you're teaching your partners or your firefighters to help you, um, the two things that I always show them if, uh, if they're learning is uh, the if they're going to do help out with the limb leads, the longer two leads go down to the legs because your legs are longer than your arms. So there's your legs. And then whenever your partner's helping you with the 12 lead, uh, the street light colors are V1, 2, and 3. So red, yellow, and green are going to be V1, V2, and V3. And then my favorite color is blue, as you can tell. And um, so that's V4. And now you just made it so easy, like it's not so complicated. You know what I mean? The only thing left are your Clemson colors. Um, you got orange and purple, so the V5 and V6. So kind of know what the collars are, because that way when someone's trying to die right in front of you, you're not like trying to like strand them out and go like, uh, okay, there's V1. So just remember street light collars, my favorite collar is blue, and then the Clemson collars. And that will help you um, do these fairly, hopefully fairly quickly. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. You'll figure out your own little tips and tricks. I lost my clicker. Where did I sit down? There it is. Beep, beep, beep. For women, the flapjack is going to have to be moved out of the way. Protect their modesty. Protect people's modesty. Even me. I don't have to have my shirt off in front of anybody. And um, so it caused me anxiety if I had to have my, my um, beautiful physique exposed to strangers. And there's a lot of things going on. Um, there's a lot of things happening on scene, and you can see into the back of ambulances. You can see through the windows of houses, so just protect people's modesty. This breast is going to have to be moved out of the way. We can either do it ourselves by sweeping with the back of the hand. What do we say, Shannon? This is, ther this is a therapeutic treatment. Yeah, this is patient care. This is an assault. And um, it happened just a couple weeks ago. I saw it was kind of funny, but it wasn't funny. I didn't. We, I, if the, 
if everything is the patient stable, I really do try to bring our firefighters into the back of the truck and have them do things. Because if, if, you, if you wait until there's a critical patient to get people to do something, then they're, you're screwed, right? But if you kind of get them in there with stable patients, then they learn how to spike bags and, you know, put together little INTs and things and do 12 leads. So we had a firefighter in the back doing a 12 lead and the lady was a good sport about it. Um, but he literally grabbed her like this and went, Rrk. and my little female partner about lost her mind. <laughs> she went off chihuahua mode on him. So, yeah, yeah, he was like, Rrr! you know, he didn't know what he was doing then. He was all flustered. All right, throw stuff at me. So sweep it up with the hand. Uh, lead goes out on the chest wall. Next one's going to be out on some breast tissue. There's, there's no choice there. And then B5, B6. Or you can ask the patient, hey, hold this for me. <laughs> um, what's some other stuff? Reducing artifact. The, I don't know where, I, there's a weird pause there. I don't know what happened. I think I lost a slide somewhere. Um, which it did say, it did say it would delete. Maybe that's why I'm missing some slides because Google said that it might take slides away if something's wrong. So um, unless you have good ECG recordings, then your interpretive ability is no good. So you really um, have to take the time to want to get a good 12 lead. And if they can get them on this old dude on a treadmill, we should be able to get them in the back of an ambulance, right? And you'll notice they're not really where we would put our leads, but they're only looking for T-wave elevation. So they're not looking for the same thing we're looking for. The key to reduce an artifact is gel penetration. We want to increase the signal from the heart while decreasing the signal from all these other things. Could be 60 cycle interference from the lights, could be bad outlets, could be their cell phone, could be muscle tremors, all kinds of things could cause these weird um, sources of ectopy. So how do we achieve gel penetration? We have three big barriers, that's hair, dead skin cells, and oils. So we can prep that skin. If you had a, a, a shaver there, you could shave the hair out of the way. You could take a two by two alcohol pad or a four by four and abrade the skin. Or some of your electrodes will have a little piece of sandpaper on them where you can kind of abrade the skin. And then you put the lead on there. So if you have, um, like you'll see this, some people say, I hate MRXs, Philip MRX, because I never get clear tracings. Just ask them how they're prepping the skin. What do you mean prepping the skin? So if they're not prepping the skin, you can expect to probably not get good gel penetration. So especially for patients who don't necessarily shower very often. You know, the ones where you go to start an IV and it's just like you go through a whole bunch of Yeah, you're probably not going to get good gel penetration on those patients. So you have to prep the skin. Bling, that one's prepped. So another thing you could do is leave your electrodes in the uh, foil pack. Now, having said that, if you work at I Call Volume Service, which everyone here I think does, you can leave them pre-connected to the leads, but don't leave them in the sun because you don't want that little tiny piece of like um, that foam, that gel in there to dry out. It just looked like it might have been dried up. I have a little life in it. Nah, still got a little bit. It's almost dried out. Like, yeah, that is dried out. My goodness. Like, see, touch that little, the sticky part, but the gel in the middle is pretty much dried out. So I wouldn't use this on a person. So that one sucks. I don't know. You probably got used on you, but. <laughs> Probably. Anyway, I'm not going to go through looking for good. But that's one of the things when you're checking your truck, maybe, if you get a pack that's been opened, is you might want to look and see to make sure the gel still, gel, that's not very much gel left in those things. And it doesn't take much to get them dried out. Yeah, that's just, that's just like hardly any gel there. And if you don't get good gel penetration, you're not going to get good tracings. Most correct position, but they won't tolerate it. The more you set them up, the more it rides on the heart. And the more it rides on the heart, the more undulation you're going to get. Protect people's modesty because it kind of brings down anxiety. And um, if someone is being stressed out, they're going to have a release of 
sympathetic, right? Nervous system. So tachycardia, vasoconstriction, it causes a higher demand of oxygen on the heart. So try to protect your mosti. You could use some um, wide tape to try to hold them in place. Robert Weaver told me he was working a call in Darlington where he used a, uh, a blanket and wrapped the blanket around the patient and held it while I did the 12 lead and it worked for him. So just take some troubleshooting. Scott Dunlap from, I think he's worked several places, but Clarendon, he usually keeps a uh, antiperspirant spray with him and he'll wipe the skin and spray it. And then that won't, they won't sweat right there. And then he'll stick the leads on there. So he carries a little thing of antiperspirant with him. And you know, with stinky patients, it might not be bad to get them a couple of times while you're at it. Maybe. <laughs> you know, that's why we maybe should carry breath mints, um, a fresh pair of socks, and uh, antiperspirant. <laughs> Here you go. There you go. Just some more things to think about is don't let them twiddle the cables because they're going to be nervous and pulling on things. If you have the monitor on the squat bench and the cables are like drooped in between swinging, as it tugs on the skin, it's going to have bad tracings. Um, yeah. Anyway, don't let them hold themselves up. They'll get muscle tremors. This was done in a fire department, a fire station, and you can see how cold it is. The person's shivering. And literally, they just put a towel on the patient's chest. And it was enough to knock out the shivering. So it just takes some troubleshooting. You have to have the desire, the knowledge, if you want to get a good 12 lead. And remember that 12 leads are not like broken hips. You know, four hours from now, a broken hip is going to be a broken hip, but the cardiac thing is very dynamic. So this is eight minutes apart. You can see that they have an anterior septal MI, there's some lateral involvement. Eight minutes later, after the nitro aspirin, they're starting to get back to baseline. If I had that, they would be on my pads before I got to eight minutes later, but that's just me. And these are 12 minutes apart. There's nothing up here. And then all of a sudden you got some anterior septal MI happening. So, you know, it's a dynamic event. So we should be doing serial 12 leads. How do you validate a 12 lead? Do you guys go to urgent cares or doctor care, or doctor's box and they hand you a 12 lead? To validate it, it's an easy process. You look at lead one for global negativity. So this looks a lot like AVR, doesn't it? So that's global negativity in lead one. That means you have limb lead reversal. Someone has put the one that goes over here, over there, and the one that goes over here, over there. So these are just examples of, of those are good. This is an example of limb lead reversal. And it just means that they've been put in the wrong location. We just fix that. That's easy. Pop one off, stick it on the other side. So if you do see limb reversal on your 12 lead, that's what that's referring to. And then the second thing we look for is R wave progression through the precordial leads. So we just look for this. There's a little R wave. Look, it's a little bigger. It's a little bigger. It's a little bigger and it's positive. So if you have, you don't have global negativity in lead one, you have R wave progression, that would be a valid 12 lead. So to validate this 12 lead, I just look at lead one. It doesn't have global negativity, and I do have R wave progression. So now I will accept this 12 lead as it is, and then I'll interpret it. So I go, no, 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 no. But that doesn't meet the criteria for STEMI. But I just noticed while I was saying that, look at that ST segment depression. ST segment depression. That probably needs a posterior, you know what I'm saying? Probably needs a 15 lead. Well, what happened to AVL? That's a weird notch in AVL, ain't it? There's some little bit of notching over here, too. So I'm not so sure what's going on in AVL. You know, these both have the same weird thing happening. It might be a problem with that lead out here. But look, there's some slurring on the back side of this, like a delta wave. That's pretty interesting. So it could have some delayed conduction down there in the ventricles. Big slurring like it's scooping in. Yeah, see how it's going to rip? Come out over here. Yeah, you do you see the little slur on the back side of that? It's called a delta wave. Interesting. But currently they don't meet the criteria for a STEMI. I would do a 15 lead. Bam. What else do you want to talk about? You want to talk about AV blocks? Now, 
We can do that. Uh, what about 12 leads? Do you want me to, I can pull back up the first one and go back through a whole bunch of 12 leads? What do you want me to do? Yes. Some of the difficulty in understanding like rhythms, like eight bit, eight letters. Um, some of the junctional with the other functional that, and then some of the blocks. All right. All right. Well, give me. Let's um. Let's do blocks real quick, and then we'll take a break and we'll talk about rate and rhythm stuff. You guys good with that? So I wrote it on the board over here, but I'm gonna write on the board over here. And this is the algorithm I use for, I didn't lower this, just a hair, for my blocks. Did I just turn that off? No, thought I hit something. So this is what um, I use. And I was taught it by Doug Silk. I don't know if he's alive or not, but I hope he is. Um, and he told us it was called the St. John's Heart Block Algorithm. I can't find it anywhere, so I don't know. But this is what he taught us, and this is what I use. I've used it since I learned it. And to this day, now I can kind of see them, but I still will use it to confirm what I think it is. The first question is, are there more P's? P's than QRS's. The answer is no, it's first degree AV block. If yes, go to the next question. Yeah, they're serious about it. Question two, so in question one, we'll say, are there more P's and QRS's? And then we'll pull up some blocks from the internet and we'll look at them and we'll run through these questions, okay? So the question two is, um, is the PRI constant for the ones that get through? And when I say the ones, I'm talking about the P waves. The ones that get through. Maybe I should change the ones to the word P waves. Would that be better for the P waves that get through? Okay. One, two, three, four, five. And I always remember the phrase, two questions, two yeses. And then question three is, is the R to R constant.
if no, oh, I just don't say if, just say no. No equals second degree type one. Yes, equals third degree block. So once you guys have this like written down, I'm gonna get rid of the screen. You take a picture of it, you can do whatever you wanna do, I don't care. But I'm gonna to go to the interweb and look for AV blocks. And then we're gonna use those three questions to suss out what the block is. And if you've already learned another method, then don't try to learn this, right? Don't mess your brain up. If, if you got something, I, I was telling them, Shannon, I think when you were going through, I said, hey, I got this. And you're like, I already learned the marriage thing. And I was like, hey, then don't try. You do what you do. Thank you. Hmm. No, probably. You know the the I I really got I you know thankfully thank thankfully I passed paramedic on my first uh, testing thing, but I didn't know. Like, can you take that test? And um, I'm sure you've already experienced this before. If you think you did good, you failed it. And if you think you did, or if you're not sure, you probably passed it. You know what I mean? And when I took it, oh, hello. <laughs> I need some CPR training. So. Yeah. So uh, can I not see this picture? <laughs> That's what they say. <laughs> That's what she said. Um, so the, uh, I, what was I even saying? I got all sidetracked. Uh, me either. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I passed it. And then when I showed up to work the next day, because I knew uh, I knew the paramedics on my shift. So like Shan was saying, um, I went to one paramedic and I said, hey, I don't understand what the word idioventricular means. I mean, that's like five syllables, you know, and they said, Merle, meet foreign women. I, I don't know. I tried to get. <laughs> I'm just trying to look at a picture. <laughs> yeah, I'm just looking at pictures. She told me to use my finger to make it bigger. I'm like, that's what she said. What well, was that? Now I'm confused what I was talking about. What did I say again? Oh, I walked into work that next day. And so idioventricular. And the guy says, Merle, I'm going to tell you how it is on the street. You don't have time to be interpreting that machine. I said, God dang. <laughs> So I went to another one. I said, I don't understand what lidocaine, what lidocaine does. And she said, Merle, I don't know what it does, but I know when to push it. I said, OK. And when I rotated to be her partner for three months, she was pushing lidocaine on asystole and PEA. I'm like, holy smokes, she doesn't know what it does or when to push it. So and I knew that he had taken his test three times and she had to take her test three times. When I walked in the door that next, you know, when I passed the thing, I started talking all kind of shit. I said, you know what? If you can't pass your paramedic on the first attempt, you shouldn't be a paramedic. <laughs> so I came in there. I was fooling. I was messing with people. Okay. I don't have them. <laughs> all right. So if you can just like not. Can we? Nope. No. Nope. Nope. Right. Jesus. Scared me. Okay. All right, we're just going to do this. <laughs> for, I don't know what I did. Okay, so we're going to start at the top here, and we're going to ask the question, are there more keys than QRSs? Bless you. 
One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. Yes. The next question is the PRI constant for the ones that get through. So I measure this. No, it's not constant. So the third question is, is the R to R constant? No, this has to be second degree type one. This has to be a Winky Bach or a Movitz one. And knowing what I know now, the Winky Bach, it has an extending PRI, extends, 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 and then it drops one. So we can go back and look and go, oh, look, it's extending, extending, and it drops one. So the, the algorithm worked to find the Winky Bach. Do you want me to start at the very beginning? That would be the hardest one to answer using the algorithm because you make your way all the way to the end. Did anyone miss how I got that? All right, number two. Are there more P's and Chris's? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. Yes. Is the PRI constant for the ones that get through? Two questions, two yeses. Second degree, type two. That's a Mobitz two. Easy. You get that? Secondary type two. Or if you want to get pinky out, you can put Mobitz two. All right, let's look at this one. Uh, more P's and Q's. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three. Yes. Is the PRI constant for the ones that get through? This is the one where you said earlier, this is a third degree. But look, this is a very poor example of the third degree. Let's look at the PRI. It's exactly the same every time. But I know this is a third degree block. And the reason I know it is because I'm going to march out these P to P's and they're going to line up every time. I know I'm standing in front of it and I apologize. But so if I could spread my little calipers out, I would grab these P waves and I would march them out all the way across. So you should not see this on a test because this is a very poor example of a third degree block. But this is something that you could run into. And the only way you would know the difference between a second degree type two and this one is the P to P's are marching out down here, but they won't march out up there. Let's see if we can find some more. So this is one that was on a, an exam at the EKG class. And every time people lose their mind because this meets the criteria of both the third degree block and a secondary type two but it's only because we're looking at six seconds. So if we could let this thing go for a longer period of time, eventually things won't line up. But have you ever been, um, have you ever been in line to turn at a, at a stoplight and it seems like everyone's blinkers is lining up and then all of a sudden they get a little bit off and then line up again? That's the same thing that's happening here. Well, they did call it a, mo a secondary one. What am I doing here? How do I go back to the page? Let's pull some more up. Where, there's one. Bam. Say what you're saying. I'm sorry. We pull some more up. We're, we're just like two minutes away from a break. Hit the visit. Hit it over there. I hit the visit or I hit that? Okay, hit the picture. Okay, let's see if we can scribble these out. Don't look. Yeah, oh, we have a better example down here. Oh, well, the thing is, too, with that one that looks like one and the other, they are both high degree blocks. So both of them would contraindicate, um, or both, I wouldn't say contraindicate as much because I think they changed the wording that you could trial um, atropine on them. But um, atropine doesn't work on the lower end of the AV node. Does that make sense? The, the reason why it won't do any good is let's say you have a third degree block and you push atropine, it's gonna speed up the conduction from the SA node to the AV node. So that atrial rate will go from 80 to 130, but that won't change the ventricular rate. So, okay. So let's start at the top. More P's and caresses. One, two, three. One, two, three. The answer is no. 
Oh yeah, sorry about that. Hold on, maybe I don't know what I'm doing, guys. To be honest with you, I'm a charlatan. Is that what it's called, charlatan? Oh, that's better. Mo better. Mo better. Okay, so more P's than QRSs. No, three P's and three QRSs. So no. First three AV block, and the hallmark is just a PRI that's too long. I just touched it. Yeah, it's like getting bit by a snake. First degree AV block. It's too late for this, but whatever. Okay, so the second one, more P's and QRSs. Is the PRI constant for the ones that get through? Is the R to R is constant? So it has to be. Secondary type one. Okay, because there's more P's and caresses. So we go to the next question. Is the PRI constant? Nope, it's not constant. Is the R to R constant? No. So it has to be third degree block. <laughs> oh, I thought you said first degree block. I just misunderstood you. Okay, PRI. Is there more P's and QRS? Is the PRI constant for the ones that get through? So two questions, two guesses. How about this one? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, I think this is actually the uh, a second degree type two. I think it's also that. But here's the third degree. I'll show you the difference here. Uh, I think this is the a better example of a third degree down here. Is because we have one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three. So yes, the PRI is not constant for the ones that get through. No, but the R to R's might march out. But when you start looking at this one, now is when you can really see that these P waves will all march out. Yeah. And you can see there's hidden P waves in this QRS complex. There's a hidden P wave over there in that T wave and the T wave. Can you see those? That's not easy for you guys. I smell something burning. Yeah. That doesn't matter. So the bottom one, yes. So right here. Yep. So what would end up happening is this. So let's mentally We'll get to where we even went through this algorithm. The first thing is, let's look at the rate. 300, 150, 175, 60, 50, 40. So the rate's in the 40s. I'm just, I would have to take, I see 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 1500 divided by 35. What is it? Let's see if you can beat me to it. 1500 divided by 35 is 43. That's pretty damn close. So, the first, the red flag for me, like how did I get to where I even ask these questions is usually slow rates. So when I have a rate of 43, I'm like, hmm, I wonder if there's a block. So now I'm going to apply the questions to this. And the first thing is, is there more P's and QRSs? I, let's not count that one. One, two, three, four. So yes. And it is the PRI constant for the ones that get through. No, because here's a PRI and that's one. So then the R to R's, we march those out, they are constant. So this is a third degree block. And I go, damn, if it's a third degree block, the P's should all march out and the R's should all march out. So if you take two known P's and start moving them across the paper, that's when you'll find it. No, yes. 
Indubitably. Yes. I wish we could. Uh, I wonder if there's a heart block practice thing. Let's see if we can. What do you, the green X? Oh, thank you. Um, on here. Yep, I'm going to pull up. Um, no, I don't think I'm on your Brady lab. Yes, I'm going to pull it up on, while y'all are on break. And then we're going to practice some of these using the Brady lab. Okay. We're going to go through everything. All right. I'm not familiar with this, so we're going to figure it out. That's okay. I'm okay with that. So let's look at this first one. The first question is, is it regular or irregular? We have to know that because we're trying to determine what method to use to calculate the rate. So I do have the calipers kind of spread out already up here to help visually see that the R to Rs, they are regular, correct? That's correct, continue. What's well, our rate? So I know if I have a regular rhythm, the most accurate method is the small block method. So I count these 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 46, 47, 48. So 1500 divided by 48, 1500 divided by 48 is 31. So I want to put 31 in there. Everybody's cool with that? Oh my God, it's 32? Okay. That's okay. What am I supposed to do here? Oh, I didn't do the uh, HRO rate, my bad. I didn't even notice that was over there. Uh, that's okay. Um, are there premature beats? I don't see any premature beats. Oh, I see. I didn't see that either. Interesting. Uh, the QRS, let's see if we can. Okay, it's 0. 0.8. <laughs> it is not easy to use these little calipers. Oh, good. Now, does the calipers itself tell you anything? No. All right, so it looks like it's three blocks to me. So I'm going to point. It doesn't matter. I, it doesn't hurt my feelings if it says I'm wrong. Close enough. Hey. So what is our interpretation now? I'm going to go back to my questions for AV blocks. Question one is, are there more pieces? Answer is yes. Is the PI constant for the ones that get through? Is the R to R constant? So that means it's a third degree block. So let's find it here. Uh, Wait a minute, I don't understand. It is a complete heart block. Where do you see ventricular escape focus up here? That's okay. It doesn't It doesn't bother me, I'm okay with it. I'm just wondering like, where does it say this at up here?
Oh, oh, no, wait a minute. It's clicked. What's the check mark there? Uh, well, it's wrong. That's okay. We're right, and it's wrong. Let's do, let's, what's this same thing again? What does that mean? I didn't see that anywhere. Oh, there's a qualifier thing. Okay, let's let's try it again. We'll try this again. That's okay. I'm not printing. Do you just hit this? Oh, there's the next button. Okay. Oh, look at this. That's that's messed up looking. Next. <laughs> All right. So, what are we looking at here? It appears to be irregular to me. Irregular. I think that's the only thing it's asking us, right? Well, I mean, it is patterned. It's like coupled. I didn't even see that word. I need to read everything, I guess. That's okay. Well, what's our rate? One, so since it's irregular, we can just count these. One, two, three, four, five, six. Should be 70. What should say we're wrong? I'm okay with that too. Oh, where's this at? I didn't see it earlier. Oh, I didn't see that. So it's saying okay. I didn't okay. see that anywhere. I don't know what we'll have to do on the next one. I, for some reason, I'm not seeing this whenever we did that. So I count the P waves. There's one, two, I'm counting the ones I know for sure. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, I don't know if there's any buried in there, but I would still go with like eight. Well, I don't think they're doing this because we don't have one right here. I'm not sure how they're getting it. I wish they'd kind of show how they were getting it. Oh. It says, note changing PRIs and dropped QRS, which would make you think, well, that's a secondary type one, because that's what that means. Note changing PRI. So this PRI is different than that one, so that's a change. I don't see the dropped, I guess that's the dropped QRS. So we have an extending PRI and a dropped QRS. These are very interesting. So I'm gonna learn a lot from these. P waves. One, the one P for every QS. Um, I don't know for sure what we're getting at here. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what they're doing there. No. Now, I'm just trying to, I'll figure it out. It's It's teaching me. It's teaching me here. Expert says there's one. Yeah, I don't see the extra unless that's a unless that's considered a P. I don't see it. Yeah. See, I don't I don't see the non-conducted P there, but I'm learning, so we'll see. We should be able to figure out the QRS. I'm going with. Oh Lord. <laughs> Let me look at my screen. Uh, 
I'm going right on that dark line there, and I'm going to say it's Yeah, sharing me not being able to figure this thing out, but I'm working on it, so that's okay. I was close. So interpretation. I'm not seeing it, but given the hint that it gave us, it's a second degree type one. Well, let's see if we can use the questions to get it right. But I don't see more P's than QRS. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I don't know if eight, if you do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, must be counting that. They must have counted that one. And the PRI is not constant for the ones that get through because there's a changing PRI and the R to R's don't line up. So using the rules, you would end up with secondary type one. Qualifiers. List any additional features relevant to the rhythm. I don't see anything else. Okay, let's do another one. Oh, is this the same one? We gotta go next, don't we? Se uh, secondary type one, sorry about that. We just went through the questions. Are there more P's and QRS? There was like seven P's and six QRS's or something. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. The PI was not constant. You can see it changes. The R to R's were not constant, so you're left with second degree type one. Next. All right, let's try another one. Let's see. Is it regular or irregular? Let me put this in the middle. Regular. These were our They look the same. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Well, I mean, if you miss it by one, they're going to ding you. Let's see. Five, 10, 15, 16. 1500 divided by 16. I'm going to say 94. I was going to say 90, but I'm saying 94. Oh, whew. look at me. The toad is teaching me. The P ways, it has one upright P way for every QRS. The PRI, it looks too long to me, but let's check it out. Let me slide this thing over. These calipers are dorky. Point 24. Hey, look at us. Q 
QRS. A good guess there. Looks two blocks wide to me. Okay, two and a half. I'm okay. Um, so what do we have here? Are there more? P it's a sinus rhythm, right? But look at the P the PRI was too long. Yeah, first degree AV block. So if you went through the AV block questions, are there more P's than QRS? No. So it has to be a first degree AV block. And is there anything else we're supposed to click in here? Sinus. Uh, but see, I can't click normal because it's not normal. I'll click it, but it's against my will. Oh, you got me. Yeah, I don't use the word normal very often. Yeah, and then down here it just says science rhythm, but whatever. Qualifiers. I don't see any qualifiers. Okay. I missed I missed that one. Okay, okay, let's see. All right, so this looks like a good one. Um, is it regular or irregular? That's very hard to tell because we only have two R waves. Let's see, one, let's see here. Two, three, boop. One, two, three, boop. I'm going to say it's regular. Fuck it. Sorry about that. Regular. Oh, it's a very slow rate. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65, 67, 68. 1,500 divided by 68 is 22. The atrial rate is not the same. There's a whole bunch of atrial. So let's see. Let's see. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, so about 120. Uh, 125. I should have did the little counter to blocks, but the P waves. The PRI was, um, you can't do that. Boop. Um, oh, unrelated. Yeah, they are unrelated. Oh, boy. Well, I'll tell you one thing. These are not fun. I think we would be better off finding rhythms on the internet. Yeah.
I don't understand the escape focus thing. I still don't see the, I don't see that term. Um, I'm not sure where some good ones are. Let's see. The Wall Raven? Okay, say it one more time. That's German. <laughs> Strips here. Huh? Advertisement trying to get me. I just might pull up some stuff on my computer. I don't know where some good ones are. Maybe we can do some of these. Is that, can you see that good after you zoom in? How do you zoom in on this? All right. Well, this is, maybe we can practice some here. I don't know. We'll find out. So what's the rate? Five, 10, 15, 20, 23. 1,500 divided by 23. The rate is 65. That's good, right? Do we have um, the rhythm? Or where is that? It was regular. I forgot to start there. It's regular. The rate 65. Do we have a P for every QRS? Is PRI within normal limits? QRS is nice and tight. So what is that rhythm? Normal science rhythm. Nobody any problems with normal science rhythm, right? Bam, hey, go to, how do you get to the next one? Oh, there it is, bam, thank you. Woo, look at this. So it's very fast. It's a wide complex tachycardia. So most likely VTAC. To confirm it's VTAC, we really need to make sure it is regular. It looks regular to me. Because you will see some AFibs with aberrancy that look a lot like that, but they have uh, they're irregular. In that case, it's a AFib with aberrancy. Everybody's good with VTAC. I am. All right, that's interesting. So the rate's slow. So that's not good. Um, is it regular or irregular? It looks like we're missing something right here. What's the rate? 20. Because <laughs> if it's irregular, you're just counting the QRSs. Sorry about that. Um, the next one is, is there a P for every QRS? No, I see P's out here too, extra P waves. And so we don't have a PRI. We can look at the width of the QRS. And it looks like it's about four blocks wide. So it's a little wide. Um, I would probably do the heart block algorithm on this. Are there more P's and Chris? Yes. Is the PRI constant for ones to get through? No. Is the RR constant? 
No. I don't know. Hold on. Let me look at this. This is a lot of crap here. See how these P's are marching out? I think this is a third degree block with an arrest. So I think this, the ventricles gave out and stopped. I don't know. Let's see what choices it gives us here. What's it say here? It basically goes from one to just about asystole. Let's see what it say. Hey, he gave it to us. No, we're missing one right here. But it just looks like we had ventricular standstill, like it just stopped. So, but the only the closest thing you could say is third degree block. The atrial rate all marches out. The ventricles give out. There's. I was looking down the list to see what else it could weird thing they could throw out there. They don't. There's nothing else weird. Okay, this looks very familiar. <laughs> so uh, interesting. Let's see. So is it regular or irregular? Looks regular to me. Do we have a P, uh, the next thing? We what's the rate? 5, 10, 15, 20, 23. So 1,500 divided by 23. 65. Oh, you already did it. I thought you just throwing numbers out of there. Really good. So do we have a P for every QRS? Is the PRI with the normal limits? That's where we need calipers. So let's mark this PRI. And um, here, let me do it like this. Can everyone see where I marked the paper? All right, so now I'm just going to slide it up here and compare it to the a big red block. And you see it's too long. Can you see that? So our PRI is actually eight blocks or seven blocks. Looks like it's seven blocks. So seven times four is 28. And we have to deal with those two decimal points. So the PRI is 0 0.28. 0 0.28. Is the what's the width of the QRS? It looks like it's two blocks. It's nice and tight. So then we say, okay, what is this rhythm? The sinus rhythm with first degree AV block. That's right. Easy, easy peasy lemon squeezy. So you guys are getting these sinus rhythm. Whoops. I think you can only pick one though. It's not normal. Whoop, zoop. Oh, this one's kind of tough. So, um, it's fast. I can already tell. I look in the. Is it regular or irregular? It looks regular to me. Did you say irregular? Uh, it looks regular to me. Um, so, what's the rate? So, five, nine. So, 1500 divided by nine. One sixty six or seven, so yeah, so one hundred and sixty plus. Do we have a P for every um, QRS? Well, is that a P wave or a T wave? It's hard to tell, right? So, if you think that is a P wave, well, this is definitely a sinus tachycardia. But if you think like me, I'm not so sure. Then it would be a supraventricular tachycardia. I would say this is SVT. Great rate of one hundred and fifty. Can't quite make out the P waves, but everything else lines up. Everyone's cool with that. That's what I would pick as SVT. I could be wrong. And if I am, I'm okay with it. So that was SVT. All right. Regular or irregular? Regular. Um, what's the rate? Let's see. Uh, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. 35, 36, so 1,500 divided by 36, 41, that's too slow. Do we have a P for every QRS? Is the PRI within normal limits? QRS is nice and tight. So we have a sinus bradycardia. It doesn't mean anything. We'll check a pulse, check a blood pressure. If this person is um, 
super fit and running um, marathons and stuff, then I wonder if I'm sharing the screen. Yeah, I'm sharing that screen. Am I recording? Yes. Okay. So sinus bradycardia doesn't mean anything. So what's the treatment for sinus bradycardia? At the dock eating. That's what I remember. Atropine, TCP, dopamine, or leave the fed some type of uh, at the dock eating. So for only symptomatic bradycardia. So atropine, transcutaneous spacing, dopamine, and then epi infusion or epi, push dose epi or whatever. Did we, we already answer it? Oh, check it. Yeah, y'all. We're rocking it. See, you guys don't need help. What happened, what's the problem is, is the stuff that you're being tested on is garbage. Because <laughs> you guys are rocking these out. Okay, this is a good one. So, what is the rhythm? Is it regular or irregular? It's irregular. And if you have an irregular, then you're going to count the R wave. So, one, two, three, four, five, fifty. Do we have a P for every QRS? I see an extra P wave here. Extra P waves are like the hallmark of a block, right? So, and 50 is also the hallmark of a block. So we're probably looking at some type of an AV block. I love AV blocks. So the next thing we said, okay, well, is the PRI, um, it keeps changing, right? So we don't have a solid PRI. So I'm going to go through the heart block algorithm questions to answer this. Do we have more P's in QRS? Is the PRI constant for the ones that get through? Is the R to R constant? So the only thing this could be is a, secondary type there you go, secondary type one. And was everybody in the room on board with that? We did not go too fast. All right. Was that something you could have done 30 minutes ago? Earlier today, yesterday? Okay. Okay. Well, let's see if we're, let's see if we are correct. Secondary type one. Bam, we got it. Excellent work. You guys are rocking these out. Okay, is this regular or irregular? It is. Okay, so now to calculate the rate, we're gonna count these little blocks. I like to find one that lands right on a dark block. I don't have one. So five, uh, nine plus one, so 10. So 1500 divided by 10 is 150, right? Um, do we have a P for every QRS? Is a PRI within normal limits? Dress is nice and tight. So what would we call this? Sinus tachycardia. What do we, how do we treat sinus tachycardia? We, we just look for the underlying cause. So it could be um, pain, fever, sepsis, infections, hypermetabolic states, methamphetamines, cocaine. Okay, here we go. It's interesting. Is it regular or irregular? That looks irregular to me too. Um, so then we just count the R waves. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. 120 is pretty fast. Do we have a P for every QRS? I can't, I no. can't make it out. Do we do? I can't make them out. Um, uh, what's the, um, well, the problem with junctional attack is junctional rhythms and ventricular rhythms are usually on time, the regular rhythms. So we don't have a P for every QRS. The QRS looks a little wide. Um, I'd have to mark it just for my own like curiosity. It's not going to change anything, I don't think. The QRS is about four blocks wide. So we have to figure out, like, what the heck is this? I had a cardiologist tell me, if you have a tachy dysrhythmia, it's AFib until proven otherwise. I would call, I'd be, because of that, I would call us AFib. Now, I don't have any visible P waves. I don't have the wavy, gravy, classic P waves. I just see these are irregular. You know what I mean? I don't know. What's y'all's thought on this one? I could be I could be completely wrong though. I don't know. And I'm okay with being completely wrong. It doesn't bother me. You know, now listen, if this is the one that keeps you from passing your test, you're gonna be upset, right? So you have higher stakes than me. 
I'm going with AFib. If someone else has a better idea, just let me know. Because I just don't see any like patterns here, you know. Yeah, AFib. Bam. And it's just because um, there's, I can't see the P to P's, but there's irregularity there and uh, the R to R is irregular. Does it? Oh, it has characteristically absent. Yeah, it says right here, characteristically absent. Hmm. Okay, well, we got that one right. Here's the cool one. So, and the thing you have to ask on all of them is, does it mean anything, right? If the patient doesn't have a pulse. So this one, um, it looks regular to me. And the rate would be, let's see. That's uh, about two off of there. So let's see, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, plus 4, 34. 1,500 divided by 34. It's slow, 44. Um, so the next question is, do we have a P for every QRS? We have too many P's, right? So that's a hallmark, slow, and there's a lot of P's. This, this is a block. And then, so I'm just going to go ask my heart block algorithm questions. Are there more P's in QRS? Is the PI constant for the ones that get through? Is the R to R constant? It's 30 degree block. Yep. Um, there's going to be some hidden in here. So this is a really good one. I'm going to mark it with my pencil, then I'll come back. I don't want to take a chance of writing on it with my marker. So that would be my luck. I ruin their $16,000 PV with my stupid marker. So here's my P to P's. See on that side? And then I start sliding this across. As I slide this across, there's a hidden P wave right here. And then I'm just going to mark it where it was. See what I mean? And so they're just, it's hidden in here. Yeah. You're welcome. Here's another good one. So it's irregular. The rate is one, two, three, four, fifty. Um, I see there's too many P waves. So, and it's slow. So I'm just going to hit my heart block algorithm questions. Are there more P's in QRS? And is the PRI constant for the ones that get through? Two questions, two yeses. Yep, bam. So you guys are killing us. It's doing great. Bam. Is there anyone that did, is like, I'm lost on this. This is like crazy. I think you guys are doing great. Okay. Oh, there. This is classic. A flutter. And then depending on which book you read, it's a one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one. One, two, three, four, a four to one conduction. So A flutter, whatever the rate was, four times higher than that would be the atrial. Oh boy. Oh boy. It's a time to get through about 12 different strips from this one. Yeah. Can we put it up here somehow? Mm -mm. Oh, I but it's in the book? Yeah. Yeah. Whenever you get down with this. Whenever you get down with this. Okay. We'll try to figure it out. Okay. All the answers are in the back. I don't need the answers. Yeah, I don't. Okay, so 
This is the last one. We'll take a break. What do you call this? VFib. Everybody sees VFib, right? No hesitation. Bam. All right. Well, those should be more like what you're going to see for testing instead of what we just saw with that Brady book. That was a little bit crazy. Yes, sir. No, I go um, here. What number? Because I don't have any PR. I don't have a PR in on it. There's no P wave. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out like. I think that's the isoelectric line right there. If I would measure, let me see your pencil. Yeah. To me, this looks like the isoelectric line. Okay. So oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I would probably measure from here to there. As the um, as the QRS complex. Now we'll we'll see what the book wants, but I would go from about the isoelectric line to about the isoelectric line. So six times four is twenty-four, zero point twenty-four. Yeah. So this is ventricular tachycardia. Yes, sir. Are you guys ready to start? All right, this table, what's your two strips? Okay, well, tell me what page number. Page 347. Okay. Let's turn to page 347 in our hymn book. And we're going to do both of these. The QRS is 0.12. Well, I don't think that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it says, but I put regular and it puts slightly irregular. Oh, uh, well, we'd have to, you know what? You can get a piece of paper. Yeah, get this piece of paper. Uh oh, get a piece of paper. And yeah, measure, mark like four of them. Okay. And do the tips at either the top or the bottom. Page 347. Because they're picking, everyone's picking a couple of strips and we're going to go over them. They're doing 139 and 140. Yeah. All right, so let's look at the top one there. Anytime I have... I call it FLBs. They are, yeah. Uh, I cover it up. I just get a piece of paper, literally, and I cover it up. I use EKG paper, rip off a piece, and then I say, okay, what's the underlying rhythm? So from the stuff that you can see there, does it have a P for every QRS? Yes. So we know it's sinus then, right? And the PRI is within normal limits, the rest of the normal limits. So we can probably glean a little bit of a rate because there's two here that are intact. And it's native rate or intrinsic rate would be, let's see, 300, 150, 100, 300, 150, 175, about 80. I don't know what the book says. 94. Okay, so the underlying rhythm here is a sinus rhythm. And then you say with... And then you slide those pieces of paper over and you only look at the ectopy. So can you guys, if you just look at that, what does it look like? VTAC. Yeah, you would, you could call it a salvo if you want to get super fancy. Yeah, it's, it's fancy. Or a run of VTAC. So this is a sinus rhythm with runs of VTAC. What's that? It is fancy. Patients has salvo. You could say a four beat run. That would be appropriate also because the person on the other end of the radio might wonder, I wonder how long that VTAC is going on. Did you treat with like AVO or lidocaine or did you decide? So before I did that, I would make sure I don't have any um, blocks, right? So I don't see any blocks initially because the PRI is good. The QRS is nice and tight. So I would just check for axis deviation. But I don't think that's a bifascicular block here. So I'm going to either treat it probably 
with amiodarone or lidocaine. I don't carry lidocaine. We carry lidocaine on Shaw only for flush and IOs. So we don't even have to order for lidocaine anymore. That's the wave of the future. Yep, 150 over 10. So you can take 150, put it in a 100 ml bag, 10 drop set, and run out 100 drops a minute. And then that'll give it over 10 minutes. So if you call it in, you can say sinus rhythm with a four-beat run of VTAC. You can say that. Yep. You can say sinus rhythm with runs of VTAC or sinus rhythm with a four-beat run. All those are perfectly fine. Everybody got that for 139? Does anyone not get that? Like, oh, my God, that just blew my mind. Yeah. Okay, 140. What is this? Is it regular? Yes. It is regular, right? Same page, 347, 347, and we're on 9.140. Do we have a P? Uh, so what's the rate? About 40. And uh, do we have a P for every QRS? I don't see one. Um, so we can't do the PRI and the width of the QRS. It looks weird because of that the ST segment depression, but to me, it looks like it's about two or three blocks wide, like three blocks wide. I don't know if it's true or not. It's what it looks like to me. So what is this? If there's no P wave, I think it's a junctional rhythm. The rate's 40, which is in the normal range for junctional and it's regular. So I would just call that a junctional rhythm. Um, I'm just not seeing the P waves. So. Uh, maybe it is. Oh, you know what? Look, on the end of that first complex, look, there's a little bump on the T wave. And I bet that's a P wave. So mark those two and see if they slide across and match. So it looks like on the downslope of the T wave, I see a little bump right there. Right there. So. On the first complex, the, the little downslope there. Right here. Mark that and mark, I think that little bump. But you're talking about this right here? Yeah. Okay. Mark those two and then slide them across the paper and see if they line up. Yeah. Well, what would your treatment be? What's your treatment for uh, Brady dysrhythmia? Okay. It's going to be atropine, TCP, dopamine, epi, right? So the treatment for both of these are the exact same. You just have to know that in a third degree block, atropine isn't going to work. But So you're not going to hurt somebody by calling that a junctional. Yeah, then that's what it is. Oh, you got some calipers. Heck yeah. All right, the next two. You guys got two ready? Ten forty-four. What pay? Four twenty-five. Four twenty-five. All right. Is that regular or irregular? Fave. And then what rhythm is it? Both of those. Top one or the bottom one? Oh. Okay. So this is a hot garbage one, for sure. All right, is it regular or irregular? We're doing the bottom one. Let's think irregular. Okay. Okay, uh, what's the rate? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, so like 130. Do we have P waves? I don't see any P waves. Do you see any P waves? All right, so we can't do a PRI. The QRS looks wide to me. I see some notching in some areas. So listen, I had a physician tell me if it's a tacky dysrhythmia, it's AFib until proven otherwise. So it looks like AFib with um, aberrancy to me, which is a delay in conduction of ventricles. I don't know what it says in there. Uh, VTAC, huh? well, it's VTAC then. Doesn't look like VTAC to me. Okay. 
you know, to me, it's not very compelling that that's VTAC. Well, I said 1.30. What's it saying the rate is? Okay, well, it's right and I'm wrong. I'm okay with that. There's a bunch of crappy examples in here. All right, what was your second one? So, I mean, on the surface, it would look like a third degree block, but there's no, we need like a longer strip than this. So I got P waves that all march out. We're on 424 and the number 1042, 10.42. It looks like the um, there's only one ventricular complex. So to me, it looks like a third degree AV block. I don't know what it's gonna call it, but it did say third degree block. So you can see that um, the top of the heart's firing off, but those complexes are not making it to the ventricles. And atropine is not going to do any good because it just increased the P's, but it won't increase the R waves of the QRSs. All right, who's next? What you got? Four thirty nine, ten seventy two, ten seventy two. All right. So I see some patterned um, ectopy down here. So the first thing I do is I block the ectopy with my fingers and I say, what is my underlying rhythm? Well, first off, this is irregular, correct? And if it's irregular, we're going to count the R waves. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So the rate's around 110. And I block off the ectopy and I try to find out what my underlying rhythm is. Can you see what the underlying rhythm is? So we're looking for a P wave for every QRS. We're on page 439, 10.72. So it's the bottom one on that one. I said 130 because it's irregular. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Or 110 is what I said, not 130. What's the book say it is? Okay. So yeah, if it's irregular, you just count the R waves. If it's regular, you do the small block method. Okay, so the underlying rhythm, is the underlying rhythm regular or irregular? It looks irregular. So the P's are irregular and the R to R's are irregular. So if it's irregular, literally irregular, it would appear to be AFib, but it does have pattern PVCs in there. So it'd be like AFib with bigeminy. Oh, does it really? That's complicated. But that's what it is. So the P's are all wavy, gravy, and irregular. So the P's are irregular, and then the R to R is irregular. So if irregular, irregular equals AFib. And then you have these pattern PVCs. And you could use terms like uh, unifocal PVCs because they all kind of look alike. All right, what's your second one? Four forty three ten eighty. Okay. Is it regular? What's the the rate? We would do five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, thirty-one. So fifteen hundred divided by thirty-one. Fifty-ish. Yep. Okay, so that's right in that um, AV node range. Do we have a P for every QRS? I don't see one. So I think there's no P's and the new QRS is nice and tight. So I'd call that a junctional rhythm. You, well, I mean, you could say junctional escape. It's the same thing as a junctional rhythm. Any questions on 1080? Nope. Does anyone not care? Who doesn't care anymore? Who's done? You got two rhythms. What is it? Three, 
360, 165, right? 169, is that what you said? 165? Yeah, and which strip? Okay, 165. We're on page 360, strip 9.165. So I see some a couple of funky little beats in there. I'm going to block those. Okay, what's the, is it irregular or regular? Page 360, and this is the top left corner, 9165. That's what I'm asking you. Is it regular? No? It is regular. Okay. So it's regular. Do we have a P for every QRS? Two of them look like X to B to me. The ones that are sticking up look screwy to me. So I'm going to put a piece of paper over those two. I'm not going to look at those. So huh? the ones that are sticking up. Oh, you're talking about the other ones. Okay, yeah, the ones that are pointing down, I do see P's. And it, to me, it looks like the PRI is like a little bit longer than 20, but um, it looks like it's barely longer than 0 0.20. I can't tell. Can you tell? What's the PRI? Somebody measure it for me. Where them calipers go? I see your calipers. Oh, so it is too long? Yes, it is, sure is. So, what's the underlying rhythm? It's first degree AV block width. Well, are they coming early or late? See, now you have to measure those R to R's. Is it right on time? Did you really? Oh, wow. It's some, it has to be something, it can't be right on time. What's it say in the book? Does it say ventricular escape? Is that it? Sign us with first degree block? Well, then it has to be early then if it's PVCs. They are unifocal. They do look alike. It is early. What are you talking about? It ain't right on time. Who told me it's right on time? <laughs> I see yours again. Yeah, it's really early. So first degree AV block with PVCs. All right, they're busy. What you got? 445. 1083. Is that what you said? Oh, I'm on 345, man. <laughs> 445. 1083. Oh, okay, that's a good one. So it's regular. It looks regular to me. Um, the So when we do our rate, we do the little block method. So it's 1500 divided by 10, so 150. So the rate's fast. And then you start looking for P waves. Do you have a P for every QRS? Uh, do you have a P wave? Is that a P? I can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> well, if you think that's a P wave, then this is a sinus tack. If you can't tell, then it's SVT. If it's a P wave, then it's P wave. Then it's a sinus tack. Right? What do you think it is? You think it's a P wave? When you get to 150, it gets hard to tell. Okay, well, what is this? I don't know if you can't see from there, but right behind the QRS, there's a little. I see that little bump, yeah. Okay, then the next thing would be. It's hard to tell. It looks kind of like a P wave. It looks kind of like a T wave. So here's the, here's the way I want you to think about this in the field. If you have someone that's got a rate of 150 and you don't know, how can you find out whether it's a SVT or a sinus tag? What's that? Yep, you can have them bagel down. Yep. You could use, well, first off, before we do anything, we're gonna see if they're symptomatic. 
right? So if they they have this and their blood pressure is fine and they have a good mental status and their skin is fine, we're probably not going to do anything about it. We'll try to find the underlying cause if we think it's sinus attack, fever, methamphetamines, cocaine, or whatever. If they're symptomatic, we're going to have to slow that rate down. So anytime you have a tacky dysrhythmia, you're going to do ventricles are crazy. So um, you're going to do vagal maneuvers, adenosine, and then you're going to cardiovert. So you're either going to cardiovert with medicine, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, or you're going to, uh, or potassium channel, blocker, potassium channel blockers in the event of amiodarone, or you're going to use electricity. Ventricles are crazy for tacky dysrhythmias. <laughs> for brain dysrhythmias, it's at the dock eating. Tacky dysrhythmias, it's ventricles are crazy. So vega maneuvers, adenosine, and then uh, cardiovert, either medically if they're stable and electricity if they're not stable. So honestly, if this is a sinus tack or an SVT, it doesn't matter because you're going to treat them exactly the same way. It's a narrow complex tachycardia. Okay, what was your second one? Okay. Next one. 1084, another ugly strip. Is it regular or irregular? It looks regular to me. Do we have a uh, rate? Like 120. Let's see. 5, 10, 14. So 1,500 divided by 14. Whatever that is. It looks fast. Okay, so 150 again. Now, uh, do we have a P for every QRS? I can't tell, right? Can you tell? And the, the QRS looks really wide to me. So if you don't have a P wave, it can't be atrial or sinus. And then you look at the width of the QRS. If it's wide, it's ventricular. If it's nice and tight, it's junctional. This looks like a wide complex tachycardia, which you you said junctional? Yeah, you said if it's wide. No, you said if it's narrow. Yeah. If it's wide, it's okay, ventricular. Yeah. To me, it looks ventricular. So this is a wide complex tachycardia. You could probably get away with calling that VTAC. Slightly, right, yeah. The, depends on what book you read. Some books don't call it VTAC to hit 180. Okay. But that's a wide complex tachycardia. You know how we treat this? Ventricles are crazy. It's a, yep. So you could try vagal, it probably won't do any good. You could try denison, probably won't do any good. So now you're down to either calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, or sodium channel blockers, a channel blocker, or you're going to shock them if they're symptomatic. What's the book say it is? I don't know what it is. It says VTAC. Yeah. Yes. What's your second one? What, what number is it? What's your page number? 202. And which number? The top one. Okay. Yeah, it looks like third degree block. So, okay. So, what you're looking at is the slow rhythm, and I would start already thinking about doing the heart block algorithm that we did. So we have more P's and QRS, yes. The PRI is not constant for the ones that get through. It looks very close here, but it's not the same there. And then there is the R to R constant. So we measure those out. Yes, it is. So this is third degree block. Yeah. Now, the term junctional escape, they're looking at the width of the QRS, and because the QRS is nice and tight, that means it's a junctional escape versus a ventricular escape. So if this thing was really wide, then it would be a ventricular escape. I like it. Yeah, man. Like, well, I got all kind of, I use all kind of algorithms. I use like, uh, for tacky dysrhythmias, I use ventricles are crazy. And uh, at the dock eating. For V-Fib, V-TAC, I use epi and lidocaine makes them better. So it's epi, amiodarone, lidocaine, mag, and bicarb. I'll write it on the board. Do y'all have one? You good? Do you have one over here? So someone had just asked me real quick about, I use ventricles are crazy for tacky dysrhythmias. So ventricles are crazy, just stands for vagal. Um, adenosine 
and then cardiovert. If they are stable, they get drugs, and we're going to give them a blocker, a calcium channel blocker, a beta blocker, a potassium blocker, a sodium channel blocker, and you just have to know what drugs those are. So do you know what sodium channel blocker we carry is? Lidocaine. Do you know what potassium channel blocker we carry is? Amiodarone. What about calcium channel blockers? Carzim. There you go. If you kind of understand those, those, then you're good. And then if you're, you're either going to give them drugs, or you're going to shock them. If they're unstable, you're going to shock them. If it's narrow complex, 50 joules with the exception of AFib, AFib and wide complexes get 100 joules. And that's synchronized cardiovert. And remember, they will leave your stretcher if you shock them at 100 joules. They're, go, they're, get, they're leaving the ambulance because they're not going to tolerate that. And then I use uh, at the dock eating or Brady dysrhythmias. That's atropine, TCP, dopamine, epi. And then you just have to remember when you get here, uh, like at Shaw, we don't carry dopamine anymore. It's kind of gone the way of the caribou. We carry um, levofed. And, but we do also have epi, push dose epi and epi infusion. So, but at the dock eating is atropine, TCP, which is transcutaneous spacing. Yep. And so your atropine dose is a milligram, right? So a milligram atropine. And you can give that uh, to a max of, yep, or three milligrams. Then pacing, you're going to set your rate at 70, and you're going to start low in your millivolts and work your way up till you get capture. Once you get capture, you drop it down to you lose capture, then you kind of dial it in. Um, and then dopamine, 5 to 20 mics per kg per minute, unless you're using some other type of uh, uh, vasopressor um, or dobutamine or something that gives more force to contraction, and then epi infusion. So, and then the last one I use is, uh, or there's two more that I use. One is for um, shockable rhythms, and this is for cardiac arrest. I use one, it's uh, epi and lidocaine makes them better. That stands for epi, amiodarone. You're going to pick your poison, either amiodarone or lidocaine. So epi and lidocaine makes them as mag and better as bicarb. So, then you, so if you have a shockable rhythm, you're going to give epi, flush, elevate, circulate for one minute. Uh, then, um, uh, two, well, two minutes into the code, you're going to shock them. Every three to five minutes, they get epi. So you push the epi, and then you're going to decide whether you want amiodarone or lidocaine, one or the other. And then you'll max them out on that one. And then that's, you won't give any more anti -dysrhythmics. So I push my epi, get that going for a minute. I'm going to go with amiodarone because that's what we have at Shaw. I give 300 milligrams. Circulate that for one minute. It's time to shock. Boom, we shock them. We start the code back up. It's going to be time to push epi again. I push epi, circulate that for another minute. Um, then that's about two minutes later, we're going to shock them and it'll be time for amiodarone again. So I give 150 of amiodarone and then I'm done with the amiodarone, right? And then um, you're down to magnesium. And when, why do we give mag for? Do you remember the condition for size the points? And then sodium bicarbonate, if you suspect metabolic acidosis. And then the only other one I use is for PEA and asystole. And it's literally problem epi and airway. So problem means H's and T's. Epi means we're going to give a milligram every three to five minutes throughout the arrest. And then airway. So the normal AHA guideline looks like this. It's backwards. It is airway, epi, and it does um, H's and T's down here, which is the problem. But the, the, the reason I don't like this is, is people will get um, hung up with the airway and epi, and they won't consider H's and T's until like 15 minutes into the code. So they'll be working the code, they'll push epi, they'll say, let's consider intubation, let's do the intubation. It takes time to do an intubation. Could take you five minutes to get, you know, two to five minutes to get the intubation in. And then anyway, you're gonna push more epi, and then eventually someone's gonna go, I don't know, they've been down for a long time, let's give some bicarb, which is one of your H's and T's, right? Way late. So if you can put your reversible causes first, your patients will have better outcomes. So I'm not saying neglect the airway, but if you can bag them with an OPA and you got chest rise, then airway is good, right? 
and the studies I just put on my Facebook, but another study came out. I can't remember what it's called, um, but it was just reconfirming that eye gels and intubations. There's no difference in functional outcomes of patients. So there's there is an improvement in aspiration with the endotracheal tube versus an eye gel. But at the end of the day, when they walk out of the hospital with neurological function, it doesn't change anything from one to the other. So that's why you've seen this big de-emphasization, de-emphasize the airway is because if you can get an eye gel in them and it works, then that's that's going to be the same outcome as the innovation. So don't get hung up on the airway. So I do problem epi and airway. So I'll try to think of my reversible causes right up front. If it's a renal failure patient, I'm going with the bicarb and some calcium. Uh, then I'll give the epi and then I'll say, well, do we want to monitor chest compressions with entitled CO2, which I would need to intubate them to do that? That's all the algorithms I follow for a lot of these. Tachydysrhythmias, bradydysrhythmias, shockable and non-shockable. Yeah, and one of the videos I made is those algorithms. All right, I'm going to stop this recording.